So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along this morning to the uh, HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program Roundtable discussion. Um, just yeah, hopefully everyone can see the screen. Thanks, Reese. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respect to the elders past and present. And I'd like to say that Reese Williams and I live and work on Ghana country. I'd also like to introduce Rosie Hicks, our CEO, who's here to participate. Uh, and Reese Williams, my colleague, who's here to assist. Um, I'd also like to introduce Jill Ben, Kylie Brass, and Chris Haverly from the advisory panel, who I believe are in attendance today. So the primary purpose of today's session is to test whether the proposed projects meet the needs of the research community. But it's also an opportunity to identify any capability gaps that we can't fund in this current round of development. And hopefully that will help to inform any future investment. We're really excited, and I'm sure all of you are, about this long overdue development. And we want to ensure that we proceed in a transparent and collaborative manner. So during today's session, I will give a little bit of background about the investment into the HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program. You will then have the opportunity to ask questions of the activity leads, starting with the Trove team at 10.15 till 11 Eastern Standard Time, the Indigenous Data Network at 11 till 11.45, we will then have a break from 11.45 to 12.45. And after lunch, we will hear from the Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences team from 12.45 to 1.30. And then the Language Data Commons of Australia team from 1.30 to 2.15. We'll regroup for a final discussion from 2.15 till 3.00. And we will be aiming to stick fairly closely to those times to enable people to dip into the sessions that are most relevant to them. As we discuss the plans, I'd like you to add any questions that you might have to the shared documents and we'll be adding the links to those in the chat as we go along. If somebody's already asked your question in the document, you can add a plus one to the third column and this will help us prioritise questions for answering. But rest assured that if we don't get to your question today, we will be answering all of the questions we receive in that document or those documents, and we will make sure that they remain accessible after today's event. So a little bit of background about the HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program. So the need for investment in both humanities, arts and social sciences and Indigenous research was detailed in the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap. The Department of Education, Skills and Employment, or DESI, subsequently commissioned three studies which identified a number of investment-ready programs that would benefit from national research infrastructure funding. And whilst not all of those recommendations have been funded at this time, the activities earmarked to participate in this initial round of development displayed an advanced state of readiness to participate in and benefit from a HAS research data commons. Funding for the four activities has been guided by the recommended investment ratios in those DESI studies. And we'll be hearing from the leads of those activities today. So as you know, the ARDC and the HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program are supported as part of the National Research Infrastructure Strategy, NCRIS. And these investments are in response to the National Research Infrastructure Road Mapping Process. We can see this in the program objectives that reflect the Research Infrastructure Investment Plan and the NCRIS principles. I want to now touch on the project plans, in particular in relation to the evaluation criteria, a selection of which you can see here. And we will add the link to the criteria in the chat so that you can have that readily available. 
the project plan evaluation criteria have been strongly tied to the NCRIS principles. So in particular, keep in mind that Australia's investment in research infrastructure should be planned and developed with the aim of maximising the contributions of the research. Major infrastructure should be developed on a collaborative, national, non-exclusive basis. Infrastructure funded through NCRIS should serve the research and innovation system broadly, and not just the host or funded institutions. Funding and eligibility rules should encourage collaboration and co-investment. So it's not the function of NCRIS to support institutional level infrastructure. Oh my God, what is that man doing? <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe um, if everybody could please make sure that their mics are off, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks. All right, moving right along. Okay, so let's have a look at the timeline for the next month. Um, as you're aware, the draft project plans, along with the evaluation criteria and a copy of the NCRIS principles, as well as the feedback submission facility, are now available on the ARDC website. September the 27th will be the last day that you will be able to submit feedback. So please make sure that you add that date to your diary and do take the time to give us the feedback on the plans. The leads, the advisory panel and I will be working to ensure that any feedback received is incorporated into the plans where reasonable. But we'll also be compiling a register of needs and capabilities that we can't cover in this round. And any capability gaps that we can't cover, we will feed into the NRI road mapping process through DESI. On the 19th of October, I will be presenting recommendations for the project plans to the ARDC board. Until the plans are approved by the board, they are not endorsed by the ARDC. And I would like to add that if we feel that any of the plans are not ready, that will not preclude the other activities from getting underway. So we're running about five minutes ahead of time I apologise, I think I got my timings out of order in, in um, what I just told you. So it's actually Trove up, uh, Indigenous Data Network up first, Trove up second. Apologies again, Indigenous Data Network is who we're starting with. So um, I'd like to uh, introduce the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research Data Commons team. So as part of the Australian Government investment, the ARDC will work in collaboration with the Indigenous Data Network at the University of Melbourne to support the consolidation and expansion of its technological training and governance initiatives. This work is led by Professor Marsha Langton, Associate Provost and Foundation Chair of the Australian Indigenous Studies, Co-Chair Indigenous Data Network, University of Melbourne. Professor Langton sends her apologies today. Representing the Indigenous Data Network, we have Dr. Vanessa Russ, Dr. Kristen Smith, and Dr. Len Smith. Vanessa is a research fellow in the Indigenous Studies Unit in the Centre for Health Equity, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne, and the project manager of the Indigenous Data Network. Kristen, is a Senior Research Fellow and Acting Director of the Indigenous Studies Unit in the Centre for Health Equity, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne and the Research Director of the Indigenous Data Network. Len has a background of research in demography and epidemiology and is the convener of the Indigenous Data Network's Technical Reference Group. So I will just stop sharing my screen and hand over to Vanessa, Kristen and Len. And Reese will pop the uh, link for the question and answer document into the chat if he hasn't already done so. Handing over to Vanessa, Len and Kristen. Thank you guys. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we're really pleased to be here today and looking forward to any questions that you may have about the project plan. Um, at this point in time, it's just going to be a Q&A as far as I'm aware, Jenny, yes? So please 
jump forward and if anyone has a, an upfront question about any of the work that we've proposed in the project plan. All right, does anybody have any questions about the um, project plan at all? So, um, Kristen, are you looking at Can you the- hear me? Hello, sorry. Go on, yes. Oh yes, no, I was just going to come out with a, a question. I don't know why my voice wasn't getting through first of all. Uh, but I don't want to jump ahead of anybody else. No, how? Go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Uh, obviously, this is an incredibly uh, welcome uh, initiative, and uh, I think that uh, the structure that is uh, in mind is clearly um, a relevant one because uh, what one really needs to do is work out the structure on a, a national basis uh, and deal with uh, those kind of issues of how in fact you can, uh, in the country, the side of Australia, uh, connect in with regional entities and local entities that are meaningful entities. Um, and my only sort of thing that I want to sort of put into the discussion at this stage is the extent to which uh, museums and collections are going to be built into that particular uh, project. Uh, I'm at the ANU, and uh, as well as um, uh, the uh, issues that we've been developing in the ANU to do with the data sovereignty, in particular in the context of population studies. Um, uh, we've also been working for a very long time on linking collections with communities and developing the sort of uh, models and the digital uh, technology that will enable those particular kind of connections. So I suppose my question, and I know Vanessa has been very involved in this whole area for a long time, is uh, whether that is something uh, that will be uh, a significant component of the work that is in place. Uh, thanks, Howard. Nice to see you. Um, look, it totally is. One of the components is starts with social architecture and we're really interested in, in the user. Um, I think the IDN has been also really interested in the same issues that, that you've raised, which is sort of the notion of the local and who is local and what are all the difficulties of each sort of site that you might go to where data is a, data is a value, but people don't know how to um, make it operable for them. So we're really conscious of that as well. We, we think it is about the user at the beginning and, and how um, a researcher might access it, but also how we make more Indigenous researchers. Yeah. So there's there's quite a lot in it. I think it is, um, you know, it's in some ways for the idea, and this is just a pilot, because there is so much depth that needs to be kind of traversed. Um, but we're definitely conscious of the fact that our our sort of potential beginning, our users are going to be super complex groups yeah. of different peoples with different needs and um, with different technologies and yeah. different kinds of um, internet access and yeah. so on. So we're really conscious of that, but that's a really good question. Thanks. I can probably add there to um, just uh, Lisa Streline from um, IATSIS. Um, so IATSIS is a, a partner in the Indigenous Data Network and both on our research, our digital and our collections capabilities. So um, very much um, at um, part of that discussion about where collections fit. Um, and also, um, as Vanessa said, some of this is really just a, a pilot. Some of the references, um, particularly in terms of the technical stream, um, uh, are bigger than they look. Little things like a new, a new map of Indigenous Australia, which is on our forward work playground, which is actually a really complex um, cultural artifact, um, as well as a digital tool, potentially in the future. Um, the you know our, our thesauri, we've been, but there are things that are that are components of the work that we've been doing over the last three years through the Indigenous Research Exchange and the Indigenous Data Network um that can really get cemented through this process through this um program um uh particularly around the vocabularies using auslang and and um the other developing the other answers the sora in the same way um you know building on what we've been doing with the knowledge exchange platform um and really i think there's there's opportunities to to get some really cemented um 
um, programs, but also I think, as Vanessa said, we've got to look at that um, pathway forward, the roadmap forward um, for some of those critical infrastructure pieces that allow that discoverability. Um, and just also backing up what you've both said about, you know, indi um, Indigenous research, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research is not just about universities. Um, our researchers are in communities, they're in government. Um, so that sort of complex user group. Um, we really want to empower evidence-based decision-making, uh, particularly where Indigenous peoples are trying to, um, you know, make those decisions for themselves and lead program and policy design. So the user group is quite um, important um, and, and may be different to other areas of, um, of digital infrastructure and, and research infrastructure. But I guess, you know, the learnings that we've had from all of our research as individuals and also the experience of the IATSIS massive uh, Indigenous research infrastructure that it is as a collection, um, hopefully will help inform um, the, that kind of national digital infrastructure. Great, thank you. Um, Nick Teberger asks, in the geospatial portal, will the IDN work with the existing time layered cultural map? Uh, Len here. Yeah, yes, the answer is yes, Nick. Um, <clears throat> uh, what we're trying to develop is a general framework which can be used uh, to add any sort of uh, uh, geospatial framework to uh, any sort of analytical layer to, to the geospatial framework. So it certainly includes the cultural map. Well, if I could just um, follow on from, from that and, and Lisa's um, comment about you know, producing another map. I mean, it, it, the beauty of the digital is that you can have multiple maps um, and these are always contested and they're contested variably over time. So something that's true, that may even have been true once is no longer necessarily true today. So having variable forms of the map and say, these are the different maps that we have um, and the time lag cultural map offers that um, opportunity could be more productive than producing yet another fixed uh, Horton map, uh, Tyndale map, which we know, you know, have, have been problematic. So I'm just wondering if that might be an opportunity too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, um, we, we've been inspired by the work that uh, uh, Geoscience Australia and uh, Sara have done on this uh, Loki framework uh, and that can be used to produce any number of maps, including maps with ambiguous boundaries and contested boundaries, but really does, we think, fill the bill. Great, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions in relation to the plans? I mean, I suppose the issue with mapping uh, links into that whole issue of the relationship between local communities uh, and the way that they themselves can obviously access and have input into this. And uh, if you're looking at a region as we've been working for quite a long period of time, like Eastern Ireland, I'm the only country, uh, the technology uh, that exists is extremely um, variable uh, and nearly all of the uh, organizations that are involved in which mapping should be central to their enterprise, like for example, uh, ranger programs, uh, uh, art centers, uh, uh, the land councils and so on, often use either very different formats or their formats are under development. And that's actually in the level of the sort of offices that would be in what are called the main townships. And then when you get out to the homelands or outstations and so on and so forth, you have real uh, problems there, not only in terms of people's knowledge and use of the technology, but actually indeed of the capacity of technology in those sort of remote areas to be uh, available. So I think this is something that one needs to build in uh, to the planning. Uh, and one's got to actually have, at the moment, something that uh, has the flexibility uh, to somehow sort of coordinate and work with what is there, as well as having uh, an idea of what 
uh, might be better future technology uh, that can be applied more broadly. Okay. <laughs> Did my message come Does across? anybody? <laughs> yeah, look, thanks, Howard. We certainly agree with you. We understand, you know, a lot of us as researchers working all across Australia in different communities, that, you know, people's capacity and also their technology and whatever they have access to is very variable. So we see this project as a really good opportunity of, I guess, at least bringing everyone together, doing a whole lot of the mapping work of looking at what is available across different communities, whether they be, you know, remote, regional, very remote or urban, urban areas. So, you know, it's really very much is foundational work. Um, you know, we will be doing a lot of scoping to see where people are at, but also building it into the plans going forward and, it's, and looking at a roadmap forward for, across Australia. And I'd just probably add to that, Howard, that it's really important that we start to build some sort of user case studies of all these different areas so that we can start to build a bigger picture. Um, and we're really conscious that that could take a number of years. So we want to kind of just try and, and minimise some of it, but at least acknowledge that that's what we have to do to understand what each area has um, behind them. So very good question again. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Anna Johnston asks, um, is there an update on the long list of potential project partners, noting that University of Melbourne and ANU seem to be already confirmed in the plan? Look, we're still in, in conversations with a lot of the potential partners. Um, as you can probably gather, this has been quite a short process of bringing people together. Um, we've got some key meetings coming up in the next week and we're getting together as much detail as we can as possible. But, you know, I don't know if Lisa wanted to comment there about IATS as, as partners. We see Very them as a really <laughs> core partner as well, yeah. yeah. So I guess really the three key um, groups in the, the IDN, which are the University of Melbourne, ANU and IATS as being the key partners. We've also had really good discussions with empowered communities who are very keen to be on board. Um, and also CSIRO we have on board as well. We've had discussions with um, potential partners within the University of Queensland, as well as a series of the others that we've listed in the project plan. So these are ongoing um, discussions that we will be having. And really, it is one of those projects, we want to bring in as many partners as possible, because it's, it really is an um, ambitious undertaking, and it requires everyone to get on board. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Jill Ben. Um, asks one of the project aims is to support institutions to share data more freely and cooperatively following the fair and care data principles. Could you say a little more about this project aim and how you see this being achieved in the various streams? I'd like to tackle that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look, it's quite a big question. It is a big and, question. <laughs> and some of these details that we are still working out with the different institutions, but definitely if, if we're looking at um, IATSIS and the University of Melbourne and ANU, we'll be looking initially at how those three institutions will be doing that across all three streams. But one of the, the core elements is going to be stream one in building those uh, specific Indigenous data governance principles, which, you know, we've had feedback from IATSIS and talking about how we really need to embed the, the IATSIS code of ethics within those principles, but we really do want to bring it across, well, we're going to have a round table with key stakeholders and leaders and experts in Indigenous data governance so that that process can be embedded across institutions, not only within this project, we see it as being broader as well. And the second part to that would be we are interested in thinking through um, the idea of a, a catalogue of, you know, data sets. And so how do we kind of do that? How do you, as a, a researcher in the Indigenous space, find out where all the different data is? And so is it possible to create like a some sort of index where you can go and find at least this is who has that data and then have a conversation and that they know that they're a part of sort of this broader network of, of research. So, I mean, again, huge, huge idea, but if we can launch that somehow, or at least 
get the the sort of the nuts and bolts together to sort of make it start happening. It's definitely something that should be driven over the next 10 years, say, um, so that you have somewhere to actually, you know, libraries can use it, but also um, universities can use it and, and so on. And archives can actually have a conversation themselves about what they have or what they found. Um, but yeah, big, big ambitious yeah. idea. Yeah. And it is, um, it's not, um, it's not, entirely new so for example if you think about the IATSIS archive and any of you who've accessed material um, the idea of permissions and um, uh, you know having appropriate access conditions on things is not new it's just how do you take that into the digital space so um, so some of the work we've been doing some of you have, have been involved in with the, um, the traditional knowledge labels um, some of the work from Jane Anderson, who started off at IATSIS and um, has taken off at NYU, um, uh, around, uh, you know, how can you, you know, balance, I guess, some of the burden on communities too. So we don't want everybody going back to communities asking permission for everything. So getting that balance right uh, between, um, you know, Indigenous people having control over their own data and ownership and authority over data, um, how can, can we balance that with um, the the administrative burden um, of being the um, the data owners. So there's a bit of work to do there. And I'm conscious that we're also trying to identify capability gaps in today's discussion too. And one of the ones that we've been really thinking hard about is First Nations data. So we talk a lot about self about place based and and the power of um, demographic data and, and particularly for empowered communities, for example, getting access to data about their own communities. Um, but one of the things when we don't really have the infrastructure really in place yet is for nation-based data. So um, that simple example that I always, always use that we can get data about, um, uh, you know, I don't know, Shepparton, um, but can we get data for Yorta Yorta? So, you know, that getting that, um, and that requires some long-term visions around what we ask in the census and um but that's where you know loci for example has been such a great inspiration because i know that the work that we do with pbcs around the country that you know people want access to environmental data about their country um, so there's some things that we can do immediately um, that provide greater access to country data um, and then there's some longer term things about how we link um, uh, um, population groups on a nation basis. So there's some longer term and some short term gains. Yeah, yeah. the other thing is that um, we're hoping that, uh, probably quite ambitious, that uh, we'll, we'll be able to incorporate uh, fair and uh, care uh, conformity into the metadata for a lot of these collections, uh, which again, I'll help in sort of uh, uh, make it more concrete and, you know, reduce the burden and, let, let us move on from talking about the thing to actually maybe introducing a process of certification where where it, you, know, you don't have to repeatedly uh, seek approval for access. Great, thank you. Um, and I think this is related um, yes, from, from Dale Holland. Uh, how will issues of human ethics and consent sovereignty be managed across a multi-party project? Are there any identified trial or pilot data sets and what consents are or have been obtained? Well, that's a question that no one really, I mean, we still want to try and build that through this project, I think, is what are, what are those components? Because um, I couldn't tell you who's doing it really well right now. And we need to find that out, but also how would we apply it over multiple different kind of needs base? I mean, there's, you know, the term sovereignty to me is really problematic because what does that mean to a community controlled organization? Then is it sovereignty that they're worried about? Like, is it, you know, is it stewardship that they're worried about? So I think we're, there's lots of really awesome research and thinking around this stuff, but how do we apply it to Australia when it's so diverse and complex? Um, you know, we're really different to New Zealand and Canada, and we need to kind of really think through our own local issues um, from a, a user-based perspective, I think. That's my personal take. Um, but yeah, so I think this is something where we'd like to actually work this out a little bit more in terms of um, how do we actually apply it? How do we kind of take all those ideas and then 
make it appliable. If it's not appliable and we can't use it, it's wasting time. So we do. I want to take it to the next sort of next level, which is kind of where all of this is. It's not that people haven't thought about these things and had really great conversations about it. It's just we've never had any kind of user case areas where we can go, well, let's try and apply that to this group. I mean, you know, empowered communities have some ideas of where they'd like to think through some of that. Well, maybe there's a site that we could use as an example. Maybe it could be in um, Northeast Arnhem Land, for example, as we just go, well, what do they need? What are the problems around that? And then how would we apply it? So, so I think there's great potential. And I think, uh, you know, working in the different complexities around between IATSIS as a, as a bigger organisation and somewhere smaller is going to be really helpful um, in thinking through all those different layers. So it's a really good opportunity, this project, to do that. But so we're also not, um, you know, not necessarily starting from scratch. As I said before, there's been some really good projects that will draw on. Um, IATSIS has been working with PBCs and native title rep bodies for a decade now on the return of native title materials about repatriation, repatriation of um, materials that have been collected through the native title process and getting through some of the legal complexities of that. So there's a really good case example there. Um, we've been doing a project um, that I think some people here might be involved in um, with Northern Territory land claims information. Um, and all of those have a really strong ethical foundation. Um, the Research Exchange Grants Program, the community of interest um, that we've developed there with those community-based research projects um, who are really keen to contribute to the development of um, the Knowledge Exchange Platform Governance, which will trial a lot of these elements. So um, that's, you know, so there's, there's great um, ethical community-led, community-based um, projects that already have um, this built into their ethics um, process. But as Kristen said, you know, we would expect that the code of ethics will underpin all of this. Um, and there may be some things that we can do to support the use of the code of ethics in this space, developing resources specifically around data um, that we would contribute to the project as well. Yeah, can, can I add something um, to both of those uh, comments? Uh, because I think obviously in general, they're both uh, saying exactly the right sort of area that we've got to be working in. Uh, and it is very much a work in progress. But when you mentioned PBC, which is obviously a very relevant uh, existing organization and entity that one can relate to, and then one looks at that whole area of the Northern Land Council, but in relation to sort of native title, there is a single PBC, which is I think uh, labeled top end default, uh, <laughs> which operates for that whole area, which doesn't really help us. So we actually have to have that kind of knowledge base in terms of those different regions and the different nature of the organizations, and then work out in that context uh, what people understand, even by something like First Nation, and whether that as a concept means different things in different regions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, I think, you know, it's absolutely right that we need this kind of program in order to work out the complexities and then begin to see ways through it. So I think this is one of the areas where roadmaps are good metaphor. Thank you. Uh, now, Paul Gruber from University of Melbourne uh, asks, with reference to principles, how does the application of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data governance principles align with FAIR, for example? This will be something that we are working out in the process of the project. Although, you know, there are, there are clear alignments that we can see already, it is a big part of the work that we'll be doing across Stream 1. So looking at how they can be applied. So not just for the FAIR principles, but also the CARE principles. We also want to be addressing the CARE principles in their local context. Um, so there'll be a lot of work we'll be doing on that, but we don't have an answer for you now. <laughs> Thanks, are people Kristen. aware of the care principles just as a quick so the care principles were developed specifically as a response to the fair principles if you haven't come across them yet it's worth having a look at them um, and that has a that's developed through an international data governance alliance um, global indigenous data alliance which is gida so you can find the care principles ah, thank you <laughs> uh, if you haven't come across them before Okay. 
Um, now, Kylie Brass says, following on from Lisa's comment about balancing burden on communities, how do we also ensure IDN is well set up and resourced to balance the burden and expectation of a range of stakeholders, including wider anchors? Does that relate to like a governance? I guess it just, I mean, it relates to the fact that I think this program has been a long time coming. It's absolutely, you know, essential. I think the claims on you, your time, your expertise, you know, to do the work that you're doing, but I guess what you stand for and how you, you know, obviously it's cross-cutting the work that you're doing. You know, it has absolute application, immediate application to a range of NCRIS entities. You know, I know it's not fully fledged or anything, but I just sort of think that, um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm, it is an ambitious project. It's um, early days, I guess. And it's just, yeah, making sure that, that you're well set up to kind of get this work done and that you're not yeah. dragged into a whole lot of different um, situations in which you can't focus on the work and you're servicing others' agendas. Yeah. Look, we're really conscious of that. And we actually have budgeted for, you know, additional positions to hopefully uh, lessen that. But we are um, really excited to have the number of partners we have. We think that the work will be nicely shared. And the IDN, I guess, has been operating for long enough now that we know kind of how uh, complex it gets and how political it can also get. So we're all very skilled and experienced in this field of working around Indigenous things, which can kind of go into really strange spaces often. So, um, but it, it is a really good point to make, Kylie. We, we are really on the cutting edge in terms of if we get some of this right, it'll apply really well to other things. And we think that it, it'll actually have its own kind of um, growth. So there will be need for sort of a longer term roadmap that actually ensures that it keeps going. Um, and I think that that's something we've really uh, kind of spoken to Jenny and her and the team about is that that there needs to be some sort of this isn't just this and then we shut it down and everybody goes home and takes their bats and balls. We actually have to kind of keep playing the game um, moving forward. And I think the great thing about having some of our partners um, with similar problems that they've been working on for a long time or having resolved some things and now found other things to work on is that um, maybe that longevity will be built into it. And I think that that's kind of my thinking around it is that the longevity component is going to be the key to it. Um, not, I mean, there's just so much work to be done. Um, so yeah, thanks. Good question. But also I was going to jump in there and, and just say that really we see this as a really good opportunity to actually bring everyone together um, and crystallise all the work that people have been doing all across Australia in different capacities and different ways so that there is a focus where we can all move forward together. That's, that's the way we see it. So, the, I mean, the IDN is a very broad network. Um, we are connected with a lot of people across Australia and internationally, and we do plan on on leveraging a lot of the people within the network and organisations within the network as well. Um, Peter Hayes asks, does the project scope encompass development of data collection and workflow tools similar to something like REDCap? And that might be a question for Len, maybe. You're muted, Len. Len's left the room. <laughs> uh, sorry, it, it might actually. Sorry, Jen. Steve, you it can, might actually uh, be perhaps, perhaps for me I can respond to that only because yeah, thanks, it Steve. kind of touches on the social sciences side. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and I've been working, you know, uh, with, with the IDN team on some of these discussions. So you'll see actually in the social science proposal we talk a little bit about red cap and, and integration with other tools. Um, uh, particularly, we were focused on things like Qualtrics and uh, and Lime Survey, but it, but Red Red Cap's another of these. Um, the so what we are working on within that project is looking at yes, how we can uh, interact between you know, vocabulary and, and and metadata services and some of the the data capture tools that are there. So you'll see the um, the Spire 
uh, section of our um, our project plan there actually encapsulates um, some of that idea. Uh, it depends on some of the, the, the systems that are available and the, the 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 API calls that we can do to some of those systems. But Redcap was one of those under discussion. Um, so there is kind of a mechanism within a cup. Well, let's say certainly the social science project to to, to give that um, uh, to give that some thought. Um, and then probably we could leverage that learning within the IDN project. I would I would imagine there it depends a little bit on what you're trying to put in and get out of it, out of it, of course. But as I um, that that kind of is in scope for some of the interoperability questions that we're exploring. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I think we should move on to the next question, which is, are the research community needs being met? And that feeds into, are there any capability gaps? So I'd like to invite any comment around either of those two questions at this point. Yeah, look, we definitely are interested in what the capability gaps are. Um, and is, you know, I guess, um, that's why the network's been quite good to actually to work with. Um, we're talking, and if we're talking capability gaps within sort of data, the data ecosystem, yes, we definitely want to understand what that is um, because there needs to be some, either some sort of form of training skills update or some sort of building of, of um, Indigenous people into this kind of uh, work as well as non-Indig, but you know, just trying to build a little community of data scientists, Indigenous data scientists around this work would be really great as well. So we've had a, a very short discussion with UQ. We think um, there might be opportunities in there to sort of look at some potential programs or to think about what capability training might look like into the future um, as we go along with this project. So what this project brings up might have some potential um, skills um, and capabilities training attached to it over time. So, yes. Uh, can I just come in on that too? Uh, uh, we're hoping that we'll get help from AIDC in the capability building. I mean, they've got uh, a lot of expertise going back over years in training and research data management and so on. And we want to tap into that. Anybody else? <laughs> okay, we've got a couple of comments in the chat here. Um, so we'll see the comments in the chat as well. If anyone's got a comment rather than a question, they can obviously make those as well. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe this is a capability gap. Then, you know, Sandra and Marcus both note that uh, long term data preservation and retention is an uh, issue for the whole HAS sector. Um, and I believe that's true. Sustainability of large data sets is, has been a problem in, in the HAS sector. Don't know if anybody has any further comment on that. Um, look, I guess, you know, if, if any of you who saw the video presentation, Marcia was actually talking specifically about orphan data sets. The IDN has been very interested in looking at preservation and of orphan data sets, which we know that they are everywhere across Australia, whether they be researchers who are retiring and have got a series on their hard drives or whether that be, you know, institutions who haven't digitised data sets. There is data everywhere across Australia. And we're hoping that some of the scoping work that we do will at least start um, working out some, some of the places across Australia where they are and who the main custodians of that, that data is so that we can look at how we can go forward and think about preservation and then rematriation of that data. Um, Nick Teberger asks, Seems like IDN is focused mainly on numerical data, but is it also looking at recordings, transcripts, oral histories, 
performance, et cetera? Yes, we absolutely will be. Um, quite a few of us are qualitative researchers. I'm, I'm a medical anthropologist, and you'll probably know that Marcia is a, a, a social anthropologist, social cultural anthropologist and geographer. Um, we are very interested in both qualitative and quantitative. Yeah. It's just a matter of what sort of use cases that we develop in, in the process. And also one of our major custodians we've noted uh, the GLAM sector. So yes, it, it will be across both forms of data. And I'm ex, ex museum, you know, I'm still involved in state art galleries and archives and libraries. So I'm really passionate about it. I think someone made a comment about videos and music. Absolutely, it's all in there, but we have to start from somewhere. So it's not that it's been missed in the proposal, it's just that it's huge. And um, I think. Anyone from the library sector here will know that we don't always digitise everything. And when it comes to audio sound, it's it's so vital, as we know, you know, a lot of those old recordings from the, the 60s and 70s, if they're not going to be digitised soon, they're, they're going to be magnetised to death. So so we're really conscious of that. It, is this the project for it? Mm. We're not going to have the funding for, for it, but should we be actually talking about it? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm definitely the one banging on about, about those sorts of things in, in these conversations and often talking about culture and how do we save it and return it and exchange it and build on it and bring the knowledge back. You know, we haven't even mentioned in this conversation about it's also... When, when a researcher goes in and uses something in IATSIS, how do they, do they return what they learn on top of that knowledge? You know, what's the responsibility of everybody who participates in this whole, the whole life cycle of data and, and you know, um, so yeah, we're really, really passionate about it, as you can see. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, should yeah. Also, I should also say that um, we, we would, from an IATSIS perspective and Code of Ethics perspective, we would consider data to include any information about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, regardless of its format. So that includes um, paper um, as well as um, audio and visual. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, the, the governance framework that we're talking about, particularly Stream 1 and getting those principles clear, um, the, the point is for them to be adopted. A bit like, you know, the, the, there's a, a thirst within the GLAM sector for um, uh, guidance and to participate so you can see that with the take up of us saying in the codeathons and things like that so there's an appetite there um, if we provide the guidance and the leadership um, and that's kind of one of our access's amb you know um, legislative responsibilities if we provide that leadership then people you know are in a position to adopt it so it's not a necessarily that this project has to do it all um, it's about providing that that kind of guidance and examples of the how you know what what you know, what works from indigenous governance and sovereignty perspective um, and giving people the tools to actually step through that with their own collections yeah. and can i uh, follow on from that because uh, uh, the reality is that some of the one of the sort of key uses that material is going to have when it's returned uh, to community is what people call sort of repurposing so people are going to actually be uh, making it come to life again in completely different kinds of forms. And this is a very, very important area. Obviously, I don't expect uh, this project to be dealing with everything, but conceptually it's important because there's a real difference between repurposing when it happens in the context of the everyday of the community that it's returned to and repurposing uh, in a different sort of arena by uh, outside users and so on and so forth. The boundaries are not always going to be uh, clear. So working this out conceptually is very important because obviously in many cases, the indigenous communities themselves are working collaboratively in projects that the material is repurposed for and returned for. So I think having that kind of awareness, but I mean, I'm totally reassured by what uh, has been said uh, that uh, we have this in mind. Yeah, thanks, Howard. You know, we're really talking, well, I, I'm really passionate about the idea of rematriation, not repatriation, because it lessens the burden of care for that material in the communities. If we were to return some of the materials, you know, from the burnt museum to certain communities, they couldn't actually care for it because of the cost of care is ridiculous. 
Um, however, what if they get to engage, exchange and, and relearn and renew? It's a totally different experience. And I've got multiple experiences up my sleeve from doing that sort of work. So I think, um, and then how do we then capture that data and then reapply it into some sort of preservation, conservation um, and data sort of holding? So. So yeah, it is totally um, the full life cycle that we have to pay attention to, not just not just one or two parts. So it's it's super complex, but it's interesting. It probably doesn't need to be said, but the only thing I would say in that context is that they, you know, they feel there's some really great use cases that help us develop the principles and the framework and the infrastructure. Um, but it's not the job of this project to do those projects. So understanding that we're creating that environment for researchers to engage with communities and for community priorities that researchers can engage with. And that's um, certainly the principle behind the knowledge exchange platform that is kind of still being built, um, is, is to actually connect people and ideas. And, and um, there's a, a wonder, if you haven't seen it, there's a wonderful example of that um, that we did through the Preserve, Strength and Renew project with Garajari, which was fabulous. So um, where they, you know, found some old stuff in the in the archive that they didn't know existed, it only just been digitised, um, they were able to take it back and put people through some ceremony that hadn't been practised in 40 years. They recorded it, they reinterpreted it, they're doing podcasts, they're doing new, you know, it's just the the life that that, that can, that, that those kind of old data, you know, that old data can actually provide and invigorate um, so that's um, it's not the job of the project but the job of the project is to provide the frameworks for those kind of exciting things to happen. Uh, Elizabeth Seymour asks how does the New South Wales Australian Mercur2 hub fit in with this project and apologies if I pronounce that incorrectly. I think Nick responded as well Mick do you have an update on that? Oh, well, I mean, Mukuru is like, you know, Omeka and, and these other wonderful display um, options, but they're not preservation or archiving options. And I think we have to be very clear on that. And um, storylines, um, there are others that are out there, very popular, but the risk is people are putting additional metadata. And as we've heard, you know, this is what we want people to get archival materials and reuse them in their current practice and, and refresh and you know all, all that wonderful stuff but if that doesn't go back to a proper repository then it's all at risk of being lost yeah. so um and i think we need to get this message out very clearly because people love the presentation systems that these provide but they're not long-term solutions thanks for that comment nick We've got about five minutes to go, so I think I'd like to give an opportunity to Kristen, Len and Vanessa to make any summary comments, and Lisa, of course, um, if they would like to at this point. I guess just initially, uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your input and your comments and feedback. It's really helpful. Um, and just leading up until the point when we're finalising the project up to the 27th, we really encourage you, any of you to reach out to us with any further feedback or input you have. Also in terms of if you can think of, if you're within an organisation who you think should be a partner in this work, let us know and we'll have a conversation with you. We're really, really open and see this, as I said before, as an opportunity to bring people together across Australia to work on these really foundational principles. Thanks, Kristen. Vanessa? Uh, I, I probably would just, you know, I'm always banging on about this, but I really want to see um, a, an uptake of Indigenous people working in this area. I think there's some really great potential in terms of just having a, being a data scientist or being someone who actually understands um, how all this is going to work into the future and, and drives it from an Indigenous um, position and, and encourages community to really embrace it because I think um, it's yeah I think it's a really good opportunity um, for, for mob to get involved as well as, as researchers as well there's a lot of Indigenous people who are not haven't gone through tertiary education who might actually be really good researchers as well so I'm, I'm all about you know the local so thanks. Thanks Vanessa. Lisa would you like to say anything? Uh, no, I just thanks to Kristen and Vanessa and Len for letting me <laughs> throw my hat in the ring today. I'm happy to, really excited to, to, to get 
things started and uh, we'll be um, putting our um, support behind the activities we've got some resources to contribute to just in terms of what's required for the evaluation, um, certainly in this first year. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Great. Thanks. And Len, finally? Uh, well, just to, uh, I guess, reassure people that um, uh, the preservation and salvaging of existing data is a real priority. I mean, it's a real challenge too, but uh, uh, certainly, I wouldn't want anybody to go over with the impression that it's, it's low down on our list of priorities. It's clearly near the top because the whole concept of data repatriation or rematriation, as my colleagues prefer to call it, is giving back to people data that's been collected about them, which in many ways, in many occasions, they don't even know exists. Thanks, Len. So we will leave the um, question and answer register available for everybody. So if there's something that you think of that you haven't been able to ask today, please make sure you pop it in that document and um, someone from the IDN will be able to answer it. Don't forget to submit your feedback. So the final day for that once again is the 27th of September. And um, I'd like to thank Kristen Smith, Len Smith, Vanessa Russ, from IDN for being with us today. And hopefully you can all hang around for our next session, which is on Trove. So without further ado, so the next session we're talking about is developing a Trove researcher platform for advanced research, augmenting existing National Library of Australia resources. This platform will enable a focus on the delivery of researcher portals accessible through Trove, Australia's unique public heritage site. The platform will create tools for visualisation, entity recognition, transcription and geocoding across Trove content and other corpora. Alison Dellett is the lead. Alison is the Assistant Director General, National Library of Australia Collaboration Branch. The collaboration branch is responsible for carrying out organisation partnership functions that enables the library to collaborate with the GLAM community and provides a range of services relating to Trove, including the digitisation program. And I'm sure that Reese is just about to put the link to the document into the chat. There we go. So, um, Alison, are you with us? I am indeed. Hello, welcome. Um, oh, we've got a question already. Um, while Trove is itself provides exemplary integration as an aggregator, there is little detail of how it will integrate with other programs, uh, IDN, IRIS and LADACA. And that's from Nick Teberger. Okay. Can people see me if I'm talking? Yeah, I can see Great. you, Alison. That's excellent. I'm struggling a little bit, I will say, with the technology this morning at my end. Um, so if something goes wrong, I will take it as, um, yes, give me a bit of time. I might start, before I answer the question, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction, if that's okay, Jenny? That's fine. Okay, good. Um, and actually, I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from Ngunnawal and Nambra country, um, which is putting on a glorious display for those who are not in Canberra. This is a beautiful time of year um, in our local area. Um, but I would like to pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and the Nambri and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are present here today. Um, and as Jenny explained, um, my job title um, is the somewhat grandiose Assistant Director General um, for collaboration. I would rephrase that slightly to say that what that means is that I'm responsible for every for Trove, the full set of operations at the National Library, as well as a set of our other collaboration programs and um, the digitisation, three of our, or all of our digitisation programs, which comprises three separate things. What I want to, I'm also going to say that I'm joined today and I'm going to ask him to say something in a tick by Tien and Kelly. Um, Tiernan is the project lead for us on this. And up front, I'll say that all of the detailed questions that we get in, I will need to click 
to um, flick to Tim and to answer, as he's been the person who's been coordinating work at the National Library. Hello. Um, the difficult questions come to me. That's my job. And um, I'm conscious that there are a number of difficult questions in the space. Um, so that's, if you like, the breakdown that we'll be using today. And I'm also, because I have been trying to follow the chat, I'm going to respond to a couple of things that have come up in the chat as well. Um, so what the library is attempting when we're putting together this um, project plan or the, the process that we're doing, we look at what we think that Trove brings to the space. And this is a discussion that many of you are aware Trove has been going back between Trove and the research sector or the National Library and the research sector for some years now. And what we think we bring as a strong asset in this space and where we can have the most impact at this point in time is in looking at how we can bring researchers who are using Trove but are not using any other digital tools into the space. So that's been our intention for the audience from the start. The researchers that we are seeking to empower and to work with as part of this are not people who have already been working in the digital space primarily. And I'll come back to the question of partnership in a minute. But it is saying that we know that there are literally um, thousands of academics who are using keyword searching and Trove as a mechanism to produce their research. We would like to look at how we can take what the rest of this community has developed over years, which are fantastic tools but are not being used by a broad audience, and see how we can use Trove's platform and reach to extend them to the audience. So I want to be very upfront that that's the concept that we've worked on for some time beforehand. And that's where we're coming from in terms of looking at what we might be able to achieve in terms of leveraging the strength. I also want to talk about some of the constraints because we've got a lot of constraints and those things are starting to become more of the pointy edge of the conversation. And this is an odd partnership, I think, for both the ARDC and for the, the library in that it's an attempt, it's not a partnership that we've led before as a research institution, we haven't led a project. The National Library of Australia is not actually a research sector funded organisation. Let me rephrase that. National libraries internationally have a sequence of tasks. One of the very common models for a national library is that they have primary research, uh, primary responsibility for supporting the research sector. Australia's National Library does not. It's actually quite specific in our act that our audience and our function and our purpose is um, the general public. That's been an ongoing constraint for the National Library and it's partly why we offer, well, it's not partly why, it is why we offer a lot less support to the research sector than most comparable, in, well not, than a number of comparable international um, nat national libraries. I'll also make the point that that's not something that's been decided by the staff of the National Library. And um, I wanna come back to how we see the research sector and our connection to public service in a minute. But it is a factor in the way that we're organized. The other thing I want to say, and I have been listening here, but I wanna say it more explicitly, even though we'll be careful, is that the current climate that we are working within is pushing that difference from a political level in a, it, it isn't moving away from it. That is, we are very clear on what our minister and our process and we are a public sector organisation expects from us. And that has been increasingly that our mandate is to serve the general public and not necessarily the organised research community. So all of that is part of the context that we're working within and part of the context that we're trying to juggle in how we move forward. Trove has been a great service to both the general public and the research community. The thing that I love about Trove, and when I use eyes here, I'm not speaking on behalf of my institution, I'm speaking for myself, is very much that I think it lessens the gap between an academic and research community and a community that like research and might move in that direction. I think we actually bring research together into other areas and that's part of the strength and the process. We're also aware that the product and the impact of Australia's research community in producing output actually results in enormous amounts of public good and engagement. And that's part of our mandate in a way that isn't represented in the 
I'm going to make all of that because I understand Janet McCalman's point earlier that the National Library, it's nice to know we're trusted. Um, and it's nice to know that it's a, a trusted and the owned repository. But actually those points about culture are real. They're not about the decisions of people who work for one organisation or another, but the National Library is constantly poised in this difficult situation around the research sector. And many of you know that part of the the push for us to be involved here was a way to try and resolve some of that tension to say that if there's funding that comes into the service which is not coming out of the normal appropriation in the budgets then that gives us a mandate to do some work for the sector that we'd really like to do but it's not that easy when you're internally to look at how it might work um yeah all right now i've got to read my handwriting briefly here which is not going too well um so yeah, all of that is a sense of constraint, plus for a public service organisation, it means that things are more experienced for us. And also I will point out, we're just, we don't work like a research organisation. Um, this culture is quite um, different to ours. Um, and it's an interesting process to engage with it that we're still upskilling. Very few of our staff and our process actually have come at this point in time out of the academic sector. And I think I'm gonna acknowledge that because we will be looking to make some changes. And I think that cultural difference is a bit of the issue that we're trying to get, that we're trying to bridge at the moment as well. So all of that is to say that there are there are some things today that I'll take brief questions on that are actually probably likely to be sticking points as we look at the interpretation of the inquest principles and the National Library's role, but I don't think that's the most useful place of today to deal with. We'll deal with those as we move forward. Um, and there is an environment that we're trying to work within and I am being recorded. But within that constraint, what we're aware of from where we put forward the project plan, and I'll have an, I'm not reading the chat screen at the minute, I will look at it and read it in a second, um, just to limit to the number of things I can do at once, um, is that we do, we have taken some, we've had very little formal feedback actually, but we've taken quite a lot of the informal feedback in the processes and we're starting to think about what we might look to change as we move forward. Probably the key thing is that we do acknowledge that what we took as a brief here probably to produce a product will need a partnership process. I will say up front, I haven't spoken to Rosie and Jenny about this, but I think it means it's likely that we're going to need longer than the October deadline to work through the process. And we're hopeful that wouldn't hold anyone else up, but we'll have to look at how that moves here. So we are going to need to look at how we can do this more as a partnership within an institution. Um, and we are going to need to look more at how we work within the research output sector and the processes we move forward. So that's the piece that we can take both useful feedback on and working through. Where I will come back to that we would like to continue to pursue though, is that the concepts and the processes and particularly our sense of audience is how we'd like to move forward. One of the concrete questions that we did get before and points that were raised is we know how badly the research community want more APIs from the National Library and more backends coming out of what we do. Um, and we could have gone down a direction in this context of talking about producing more APIs. I want to be very upfront about the reason that the National Library is not putting that forward. And that is because we think that the best route for demonstrating value to our audiences and being able to do this again, is if we can demonstrate that we have broadened the base of researchers using these tools. And we're not convinced that the API is the most effective way to target that. It's not because we don't want to do the API. We do want to do the API. Actually, the API is less work for us. We like the APIs because they don't result, like dealing with end users is a lot of what we do. So there's no issue about that, but it is about this project and this moment in time and how we think we use this project as a building base to the next project which would come out of that space. I will add too that in particular the API that we most get asked for for the web archive does put us in an enormous amount of privacy and legal work and we, that would eat through a large portion of the budget in a very unexciting way before we would come out to the other side so that's a constraint for us in that sector as well. I also want to acknowledge that largely what we are doing has got some crossover points. Now, partly we want to address that through the partnership. So I will say we'll be looking at a different tax. So we're not looking at rebuilding things that people have already built as much as we are forming some partnerships where we can pull it in. But I want people to understand that part of that is because actually the expertise has been fantastic. And we honestly think that there's quite a lot of work that we can pick up and repurpose for our community that would bring large numbers of um, academics into a fold of being able to do new research questions because we can make what's already been done more accessible. So that's the way that I would put that. There's absolutely no disrespect intended to people who've put previous work in quite the opposite. This is such an innovative community and it has developed so much value and process. So I want to acknowledge that that may not have come through and that we can pursue the partnership piece in a way to do that. 
at that point, I might stop and have a look at the chat screen and take any specific questions. Again, just noting, give me a minute to take in the information. I've got about four screens working at the moment. So I will do that, but I might, um, yes, so just, um, or if Jenny wants to summarise questions for me, that'd be awesome. Um, well, I think we'll start with the question from Nick Teberger, which has got plus three um, upvoted now. So while Trove is itself um, provides exemplary integration as an aggregator, there's little detail of how it will integrate with the other programs, being the Indigenous Research Capability, um, IRIS and LADACA. Um, my understanding is that is one of the pieces of feedback we'll integrate and look at, um, Nick, in terms of moving forward. Integration has been posed as the key thing that we're looking at in terms of how we can move forward. And again, it's partly an artefact of the fact that we came up with the project plans probably a little bit in advance, actually. Tin, and do you have anything you'd like me to add to that? Uh, nothing uh, additional, really. Uh, yeah, we are really um, excited to... Uh, sort of pursue a few different sort of avenues of where we can actually integrate a little bit more. Unfortunately, we just have not had the time to actually develop those pathways as yet. Um, Ian McCrabb says, can the design documentation suite for the project use cases, technical architecture, be made available for review? Um, absolutely. It would be the simple... Am I on? I'm being talking here, sorry. Um, absolutely, we can. But I'll make the point that part of the point about the partnership is we might slow down a little bit from here, so we'll make it accessible as soon as we can. I'll also add um, one of the constraints that we're working out because we want to build some of this into Trove as well as to make it, and I will go to we really do want to build it into Trove because we think it will, we think it's going to help the whole community to do that. That's why we want to do it. But Trove's back end is absolutely accessible on, we're not, we don't have any proprietary code or pieces, but it is a mess. Um, so what it means is that a lot of the time when we make the code bases um, accessible and transparent, people get back to us and throw their hands up in horror. So can't help that. But to the extent that we build this discreetly, we'll share and we're very happy to be transparent over all of that. Thank you. Uh, Richard says, I take Alison's point that the NLA should serve the public, but aren't researchers part of that public? Both researchers in the formal university space and informal researchers who follow interests and passions in a less formal way. Absolutely, they are. And where we build services for aimed at an audience that people participate in, and I'll go to, I'll back to what we started. Trove as a keyword search facility was built for the general public and is actually being used by a very large portion of the research community. Where we get into sticky things is where we build functions that are only going to be used by that audience. That's where things get, I would just use the word sticky. Um. Right, I'm going to jump forwards now to a question that's come up under the are the research community needs being met? And Anna Johnston asks, what methods have NLA used to identify research community needs, especially given their broad and ambitious definition of that community? I can answer that question. Uh, so we have done uh, some initial uh, work with uh, the community to actually identify what uh, the needs were. Uh, we have a bit of an uh, idea generally of um, where uh, community requirements lie, um, both from sort of uh, some work with the community, but also uh, from uh, the feedback that we receive on an ongoing basis uh, from members of the community. Um, so the methods that we used um, and are trying to use going forward um, really are sort of based in trying to um, engage with um, with the broad sort of research community. The other piece that I'll add, and again, I want to note, we'll, we want to slow down a little bit here and target since part of the, the version of partnership is we'll be targeting doing more intensive work with a particular community. I don't want to say more than that at the moment. There's a couple of things in the option. But the other thing that we can go back to and rely on is we actually did a survey in 2018 of Trove, um, in fact, we did two, one of which had approximately 375 researchers working in universities respond to and give us the sense. So we're actually relatively confident on reaching some of that broader audience. 
it's difficult because one of the things is that that audience tends to tell us that what they want is better keyword searching because that's what they're doing, right? So that's your line between consultation, imagination, and so on. So it's not in some ways I think we're more confident about reaching a broader audience than understanding what we could offer them. And that's just a normal part of, that's the line between people who want, are already using a service, want to do what they're currently doing a bit better and we can move into the future. I'll note the comments about the API. Um, yes, those things are true. They could be seen. Redeveloping the API is a really large, well, it's just, it's a job in and of itself. If we could have tacked it onto this, of course we would have done it, but it, that's not a realistic prospect at this point. And again, it's not saying it's not important. It's just not what, um, what we think is the best thing to do right now. If we got a huge pushback, then we'd really have to consider on that front. But I would go to my personal view rather than the institutional is it is less likely to get us to another stage of funding than, than other projects. Alison, can I just come in? Do you mind me just coming in on that one? Hello. No, 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 no. Um, this has been really helpful listening to this. Thanks so much, Alison, because it does. It lifts what's on that page and kind of makes me um, confident, I guess, about sort of the next stage of development of this work, which is great because, you know, um, there's so much to gain from, from this piece of work. I guess what I'm just thinking about as you're talking is, yeah, and, and you know, um, this I'm sure will develop in the next sort of phase as well, but what those targeted um, partnerships look like, I guess, we're often struggling with kind of thinking about a domain level and then, you know, lots of individual res researchers. And I'm assuming that that trove um, survey in 2018 is in effect the kind of grassroots, you know, you're getting and you can aggregate from that, but you're perhaps not reaching, you know, into some of the, the research users that you're seeking to um, expand out to in, in this sort of phase. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm saying, you know, the Academy of the Humanities is here to help. Um, and certainly, you know, you know, if you are interested in reaching out, and I'm sure, you know, there's social sciences would be, would, I can see Isabel is in the room as well. There's a few, few people engaged, but um, yeah, I mean, what we can do to sort of help um, input into that and, you know, in, in a kind of advisory or bridging sort of capacity out to research sector and to sort of, you know, um, feed into the processes, very happy to do so. I should, yeah. I'm not going to talk more about partnerships because I might bugger them up. So we're in early stages. It's just the nature of today. But, um, yes, and I will point out, Kylie, you gave us the list of email addresses for the 2019 survey. So we'd be very much in, in favour of working with you. Right. Um, Hugh Craig asks, could you say some more about the geospatial tools you're planning and where you will get the geolocated data as input for them? Okay, so as part of, anyway, I'm going to get the name wrong of the project, but about uh, 12 months ago, we actually quietly ran the entire back end of Trove through a machine learning algorithm to attach um, geolocations to all of the content. Um, that's using gazetted place names um, at this stage rather than coordinates or anything more sophisticated, but the gazetted place names are pretty good at a level of granularity across. So we already have that data in the back end of Trove at the moment. We just haven't been sure about what to do with it for more reasons than anyone's really keen on finding out about. So that's where we've got the data from. We do not, one of the things that we're very, and I will say this if anybody wants to, we usually have more offers of partnerships than we can follow up, but one of them is we are looking at where we can partnership to get the expertise to know how to turn and work with that geospatial data. So as I said, what we've got in the back end of Trove is um, place names attached to pretty much all of the content, and there's a lot of content in Trove um, where we have that, but we how we would turn that into something interesting. We know there's some interesting researchers doing some work in that space, and that's one of the things that we might pursue through partnerships. Great, thank you. And, okay, right, moving right along. Paul Gruber from University of Melbourne. Um, Trove, Trove has great potential to be a launching place for an emerging generation of researchers, for example, in high schools, colleges, and undergraduate programs. How can we leverage its significance for this purpose? Can we make 
fit for purpose training and materials for this cohort and indeed for the general public? Yes. Um, I could say, I mean, yeah. Um, oh, yes. just, just to... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, yeah, just to go on that, that, that is definitely part of our ongoing um, aim to um, make uh, Trove as uh, fit for purpose uh, for the general public uh, as possible um, and to actually provide them training and, and materials um, uh, specifically for high schools, colleges, undergraduate programs. Um, that would require a little bit of additional sort of work from our end. But yeah, overall, as, as far as um, trying to build um, better capacity, uh, for the next generation of researchers, we are we are trying to um, we are investigating avenues to actually try and um, get those people excited about using Trove. Definitely. Thanks. I might just remind everyone, if at all possible, please try and put your questions into the shared document because I'm just about going cross-eyed trying to work between the chat and the shared document here. So if you can, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, okay, a critical data source that is locked away from the public and researchers are historical births, deaths and marriages. Can we contemplate an integrated national program of a historical register of the Australian people? Australia led the world in the 19th century in the registration of vital events and they contain a unique range of historical detail on a colonising and colonised people. This would require partnerships with all state territory registers. Um, I think that's definitely falls outside of scope at the moment, um, but it's a great idea and I'd be uh, welcome any comments from Tien and or Alison on that one. Yeah, I think it falls out. I'll go actually, because I will point out, it, I mean, that would be a fantastic thing. That is also within scope for what I would call my day job um, here, Janet. So it's not... Um, that is, that's actually something that would be used by many more people than just the research sector. And it, it could be a partnership that doesn't have to come out of this kind of work or this kind of part of the process. Um, if you wanted to send me an email, um, it's alison.dellet at nla.gov.au um, with more details on that, um, I might have a conversation with you in a different context. Um. I've got a quick question around the um, geo um, spatial work that you were mentioning. Um, have you tested for accuracy? I mean, I'm just thinking through, if you geo locate articles within Trove, how do you actually, do you search then for place name and then match it to the gazetteer and how do you ensure that you've got the right place name? Do you make the assumption that because the article was published, for instance, in Queensland, that the place that is mentioned is also in Queensland? Um, I, Jenny, I can, yeah, I was going to say, oh, Jenny, yeah, I, I can answer that one. Uh, yeah, Jenny and I have a mutual acquaintance that actually developed this. Um, and yes, he's matched it against the Gazetteer uh, specifically. Um, and then uh, done a uh, run a very clever little um, uh, uh, little um, program over the top that has um, uh, then excluded, um, say, for instance, overseas sort of place names, um, or try to get uh, as much accuracy built in as possible. Um, usually by um, then also looking throughout the uh, full text that we've actually got the location from, searching for things like um, Queensland um, uh, as opposed to just the um, uh, town name. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, places that I think there's multiple Richmonds in Australia, <laughs> so that, that that is matched up to the correct location rather than just, you know, the, the Richmond and it all in Victoria, for instance. So, right. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's not 100% accurate, nothing ever is, uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a high level of accuracy in there um, from a very clever guy. <laughs> I think I might know who you're talking about, Tina. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> very clever guy, indeed. Um, okay, here we go. Is, uh, this is from Tim Sherratt. If the current plan is being expanded with new partnerships and greater integration and won't be ready for approval in October, could you sketch out what the process for the development of the plan will be? 
Um, not today, just because we're not ready, Tim. I, but I am happy to commit to both. Um, we will be very transparent through the AIDC. And also, if you, we, again, if you make contact, we'll run you through when we've got it. But I've been making it up on this. You know, we just, we've, we've really been through a bit of a process of thinking in literally kind of the last week as some of the feedbacks come in. So it's just too early and there's too much else going on. Um, and we will still have to take that plan to the ARDC board and off the top of my head, I can't um, tell you when the meetings line up. So there's a lot of, um, we have to take that into consideration as well, Tim, but we'll keep you posted. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I'm not sure who this has come from, but this is a long one. Brace yourselves. There's a possibility possibly an unproductive dichotomy between API work and services for the general public. For example, having gazetted place names now accessible at the back end is fantastic news. Exposing that data in an API should be step one for building new services for the public on top of it. There's a lot that can be done these days client side, e.g. with JavaScript libraries. If you can get the data to the client in a controlled way, that's the API's job. And that's from Sandra Silcott. I'm going to take that as a comment on the decision about the API versus other focus. So yeah. I don't think I've got anything new to add to that. Okay. I, again, acknowledge the point. Uh, I think I've covered everything. Have I missed anything in the chat? I'll just note there's been some really helpful comments by Marcus. So thank you for that. Yeah. I was just going to say there are some comments in the chat which we will which we will collect together, obviously, yeah, but will. I haven't pasted them because they're not questions only. Um, the expansion of metadata in Trove is a real opportunity. Marcus, would you like to elaborate on that? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, I'll give you one very small practical example. Uh, when I was trying to use Trove in doing historical musicology, I had to work very hard to find any records that contained the names of all the performers of any of the pieces that Trove had put in. And I grabbed the opportunity to show that it could be done <laughs> by finding one. Um, what people may not know is that since 2006, if you want to do anything with music, you've got to worry about moral rights, which means you need to know who all the performers are. So taking a slightly different view on how you gather metadata for different domains would be highly productive. I could give others, but that's just one example. Thanks, Marcus. Right. Uh, sorry, can I ask, Marcus, when you say you showed how it could be done, did you find that data in a form that was already within somewhere within Trove or did you look it up and add it or, and work it out? I spent a lot of time because I've been involved in library science since the beginning of nuclear science abstracts and have contributed continuously in a sort of quiet, low key way. So I always try to use Trove when I can. Um, so when I was doing the historical musicology work and recovering the actual music, I thought, well, libraries are what I love. Let's see how they've done it. And very, very few of the few music records in Trove actually had the full record of all the performers. I did find a couple of them. And so I carefully put it into the thesis intentionally because I wanted to show that it could be done. Um, if, it, if things are to be done with Trove for that particular narrow segment of music that virtually nobody knows about, <laughs> that's a joke, um, then in that case, expanding the metadata that's captured would be prudent. Um, I could do the same commentary in other areas. I'm glad that GIS has already been covered. I was doing GIS and teaching kids in the early 90s uh, in GIS. It's one of my real interests. So I'm glad to see those that tagging has gone in. I'm just giving an example of moral rights matter. There is a second order problem, and this is one that Trove is undoubtedly aware of, 
that is when you produce data or aggregated data now, there are some quite difficult both privacy and IP issues that can arise. Um, mediating those might be something that would be worth some investigation. It's not an easy area, either of them. I just picked a very simple example of where expanded metadata would increase utility, that's all. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, are there any other questions for Alison or Tiernan? Looks all right to me. Okay. Well, I might give Alison and Tiernan an uh, opportunity to sum up at this point or make any further comments that they would like to make. Uh, no, I... Um... I will make that offer to continue to send the feedback and the process in. I am aware I dropped some new things here, so that will take some time, uh, people some time to think through. Um, I'll make the point which this illustrates. There's a huge amount we can do in this space with Thrive or with anything else. I think it's really important that we focus on something that is deliverable, will have what a government to inject some of my terminology is measurable benefit to the public straight away because that's what Desi will be looking for and that we think about how to use and I don't just mean this as, as we as the NLA I mean that we're thinking about how to use this to demonstrate the value of further investment rather than solve all of the problems through the specifics and I think that will go for all of the projects um, yeah. so that would be my final point. Thanks. Um... Tully has, Tully Barnett has asked, will we get a chance to have an event like this about the new project plan in the future? Um, and I have said, yes, we will. And ARDC will facilitate that. So we, once the National Library uh, is happy with their uh, revised draft and have got their partnerships in place, we will certainly run another session just for the Trove section of work or for any others that feel that they require it. Um, right, any other comments from anybody? No? Well, I think um, if that's the case, um, are there any more capability gaps that, that um, you know, are there things that the National Library could be building that uh, fall out of scope that we may be able to feed into the NRI road mapping process. So let's give five minutes free for all. What can you think of that you'd really love Trove to be able to do that it doesn't do now and we can't fund right immediately? Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> I'm sure that people have got tons of ideas. <laughs> Expanded fellowship program. Okay. I'm just going to add things to the list as they come up. Anything else? The web archive, obviously. Yeah. yeah so I can say, but web archive API on the list. Okay. Let's add that to the list. Hang on. Okay, somebody is uh, adding a research lab for public humanities research. Uh, somebody has mentioned expanded metadata, um, useful discussions with folks from Honey. Who, Pioneered some useful work trying to aggregate people and other core entities across aggregated sources. Digital exhibition APIs. Hey, everyone's gone crazy now. Oh, so many ideas. 
like a Christmas wish list for tries. Yeah. <laughs> How many times have you seen this before, Alison? I bet you see it all the time. <laughs> I was going to get that's uh, look. It's yeah, and that's a good part. It's it's difficult, as I said. It's not just from the research sector, but everybody has a sense of how much more could be done if we got some significant um, investment in this space. Um, I'm, I'll point out. I think it'd be very useful to record because I saw the digitisation comment. Data sources that people would like copies of. I don't think that we have ever broken a barrier that says that that's considered part of research infrastructure, but it is actually quite a useful thing for the National Library to have, so feel free to go if you like. Okay, so there's some interesting ideas there. People Australia. I'm not looking sort of... at the same document, but whoever put People Australia in is absolutely welcome to contact me to um, discuss the library's initiative to do People Australia earlier and what worked and what didn't. Okay. And a whole lot of suggestions around API development. Sorry, Jenny. It's yes. Steve here. Hi, um, Steve. Uh, for those who are the uninitiated here, People Australia is what exactly? Uh, so I, that was my suggestion. And People Australia would be an authority list of people, uh, which actually started at NLA and was at NLA for a while. And then I understand got closed because of lack of funding. Um, is that right, Alison? Not quite, um, actually. So... People Australia um, existed in two forms. There was an authority piece that is under the hood. That's actually still in trove. It, it underpins the, um, can, it, it's an essential part of the trove infrastructure in that how we connect paper identities to others. What we closed down was the public site access of it. And it wasn't because of, well, everything is because of lack of funding, obviously, at a point, but it was actually lack of usage. Um, interestingly, it had infinitesimal usage versus supporting it. But that authority piece is still working under the hood to manage the way that Trove identifies it, individuals and so on. Um, the, we actually experimented with some machine learning around identities at the same time as we did the geographic place names, which was a way of taking that into a new form and being able to enhance it. Um, I will say the privacy implications made our eyes bleed and we had to move away. Um, those, those issues around, because we are a public service, around what we can and can't do with, with so on came there. But it is some, yeah, in terms of if what you're interested in is that authorities and the management piece, happy to discuss in more detail because that hasn't been turned off. Okay. That's all good. Thank you. Um, national lead on digitization. So digitization falls outside of the scope of what we're currently um, doing in the HAS RDC and Indigenous Research Capability Program. Uh, and uh, yeah, I acknowledge that deadline 2025 is nearly upon us. And I'm sure that the National Library are pedaling as fast as they can to save their magnetic um, sources of tape. Uh, yeah, well, I'm not sure actually um, who's still here, but if Vanessa's still here in particular, National Library's actually got its own magnetic tape largely under control. We're one of the few NCIs that did. We started earlier, but we're working with the other NCIs. We're actually looking at the moment for a different project I'm doing for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander owned and controlled material, which is on magnetic tape, which is vulnerable. So I'm going to put a shout out. If Vanessa is still here, she mentioned it. If anybody knows of that material and could send it to me, that would be helpful for totally different purposes. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alison. I'll, I'll send you an email. Great. <laughs> right. Um, Tim asks, in terms of deadline for submissions, feedback submissions on the 27th of September, should we submit thoughts on the current draft plan or wait for the next? I would say if you uh, wish to, uh, I think it would be appreciated if you submitted feedback on the current plan and that will help the National Library uh, inform their reworking of the draft. 
Uh, and yeah. then we will ask you to submit feedback again on the um, next draft. Uh, Yes, and Benjamin Smith, um, and I'm sure that Alison is aware of this, there's um, Preservation Quality Digitisation Service for Magnetic Recordings. I'm sure that Benjamin must be talking about the LEAF project. I think it was a LEAF or was it a linkage um, for the massive digitisation project in WA. And they would be happy to work with the National Library assisting in digitisation. Benjamin, do you want to say a couple of words about that? Am I right in thinking that's the ARC project that's running over there? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Jane. I was just, um, I just thought I'd make people aware that the five unis in WA have got together to set up a digitization service that specifically. Thanks, Jill. Uh, Sorry. That specifically looks at magnetic media, but also can do um, uh, film, um, all types of film. Um, and transparent medium, um, and that's the digitization center of WA. At the moment, it's it's mainly the massive backlog for the, the partner organizations, um, which is the five universities and the two state organizations. But we're looking forward to, uh, as well to working with other people in other other parts of Australia as we get through. Um, thank you very much. Nick Teberger asks, where do those files live after digitization? The ones that we digitized? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we return them to the, um, the, the owner of the, the physical hard copy. So the copyright resides with the original copyright holder and the digitization center doesn't um, retain any copyright in the materials that it digitizes. Thank you. All right, well, we've got about one minute to go. So um, thank you everyone for the input into this morning's session. We're gonna have an hour's break and hopefully you can rejoin us after you've had some lunch. This afternoon, we've got um, the social sciences and the linguistics people talking through their plans. So please join us for that. Thank you very much, Alison, Della and Tien and Kelly from the National Library for joining us this morning and talking us through their plans. And I think we've got a really lovely wish list <laughs> for <laughs> moving forward for phase two of the Hass RDC. <laughs> so thanks everyone. And um, as, as previously, we'll leave that document up there. So if there's anything else that comes to mind, pop it in there and Alison and Tina will have ongoing access to that. And don't forget to put your feedback in 27th of September. And we'll see you after lunch, everyone. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jenny Fuster. I'm the Hass RDC Program Manager for the Australian Research Data Commons. Uh, um, this afternoon, we'll be hearing from the Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences and the Linguistics Data Common, Language Data Commons of Australia, sorry, Michael, <laughs> um, uh, a little later on. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the day, we've got three quarters of an hour to regroup and have a discussion around everything that we've heard and seen today. So without further ado, um, introducing the Integrated Research Search Infrastructure for Social Sciences. This platform will expand existing social sciences initiatives and provide a coordinated governance model for access to data. It will improve the capacity of researchers to access, preserve and disseminate quantitative and qualitative social sciences data sources and will drive the development of systems and tools for capturing new and emerging real-time or near real-time data. And representing IRIS is Dr. Steve McKeggan. Steve is Director of the Australian Data Archive based in the Centre for Social Research and Methods at the Australian National University. Um, so I will hand over to Steve, um, who may want to make some 
remarks before we get going. Um, Reese has put the link to the Google Doc question register into the chat. And um, so please feel free to add your questions to that document, which is what we'll be working from. Prefer if you can put them in there than in the chats because I've only got one set of eyes. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks Jenny. Um, uh, Reese, that that link you just posted seems to go to the LDACA um, link. So I've just, oh, yep. does too. <laughs> so. All right, so I can follow along there. Sorry, okay. everyone. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that, Reese. Um, yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, yeah, I thought I might just do a quick review of what we're trying to do with IRIS, just as a, um, for those who may not have had a chance to read through the, the full detail of the plan itself. So I'm just going to flash up um, uh, a couple of slides that we've um, presented in uh, the previous session, uh, the introductory session we did here. Just, just to, to, to frame the discussion for today and remind everyone what we're trying to cover uh, and what the emphasis is uh, here. So I'll just quickly share my screen for, um, for the discussion here. Um, so, where are we there? so we should be seeing, yep, uh, presentation mode here. I won't flash into main screen because I then lose a bunch of other things there, but just, just as a, some, some highlights here. Um, so yeah, IRIS is the Integrated Research Infrastructure for the Social Sciences. Um, so we've got a, a number of partners involved, uh, a number who are on the call today, uh, and we're continuing to uh, in, engage in discussions with other partners as well as part of the program itself. Um, the uh, Just to focus on what it is, the, the issues that we're trying to focus on in uh, IRIS um, in the initial stages here. Um, so the key, the key effort that we're emphasizing in, in IRIS is the integration uh, challenge. So uh, social sciences is um, uh, fairly well progressed actually in terms of data, uh, data access and, and um, findability, but integration remains a key challenge for us. Most, you know, a lot of social science researchers wanna be bringing together multiple sources together uh, and need mechanisms for doing that. So that's really the emphasis that we've highlighted um, in the, the proposal that we've put together here. Um, so integration, interoperability, really trying to align with uh, some of what our colleagues internationally are doing as well, uh, picking up particularly on uh, work that's been done in Europe and to a lesser extent in the, in the US. We also draw a lot on government uh, data sources, but I mean, we've talked quite a lot already today about the GLAM sector and the galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Uh, and you know, science, social scientists use those in a number of different ways for different purposes. Uh, but a, a key resource that we haven't touched on much today are those, uh, those outside the cultural institutions, uh, more in policy and program uh, departments. So thinking particularly about the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, as a major generator of data and similar agencies like Institute of Health and Welfare and Institute of Family Studies, but also policy and program departments and, you know, uh, Department of Social Science Services, Department of Health and the, uh, in fact, the, uh, the overarching agency responsible for INCRIS, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, you know, uh, for some examples, are all producers of data uh, that are, you know, heavily used inside the social sciences. Um, Alongside that, uh, a key because we work a lot with humans, um, uh, a lot of the available data actually needs to be kept confidential, confidential, and has serious privacy considerations. So we've got to think about some of the the challenges of act, you know, with having data accessible within the uh, uh, the fair model of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but at the same time accessible under relevant conditions. Open is not always a conversation we can have in the social sciences. So, you know, bringing together uh, some of the thinking there, and that was kind of touched upon in the, uh, the previous sessions as, uh, as well. So, as I say, so we've been focusing on a, in a sense, a two-phased uh, approach. Um, uh, so you know, from 2021 to 2023, the, and that's the, the program we're talking about today, but also looking into the future uh, about what can we do from uh, in the next phase of what's called the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap. So the focus in the first stage is really on that governance and access, um, long-term environments of creation, dissemination and use of data, uh, and data, uh, data integration environments. How do we connect different data resources to each other and metadata resources to each other? Um, 
so in the, in, in the long, longer term stages, focus on a broader range of social science data sources, qualitative data and social media data in particular, being in the, uh, an emphasis that we haven't focused focus here on this initial plan, but we'll, you know, are, are looking at in the longer term as to how we bring them together, um, capturing real-time data sources, internet of things and, and the like, uh, and then looking particularly how we bring those together with secure data facilities, both physical and virtual, that exist in a number of organisations uh, and, and facilities. So we've been working with a basically a, a research process model um, as the basis for um, how we think about where the different work packages that we're uh, that we're looking at. So really, you know, focusing on a you know, how, what's the research process look like and how do these tools fit into that process, uh, and where we you know where we bring together some of the resources. And you know, um, this is a quick overview of where those packages fit into the, the overall research program. You'll note that we haven't focused too much on analysis tools, and that's that is by design. Um, and I'll uh, say um, the the, the the point that we're focusing on is getting data to the researcher for analysis uh, and then looking at the, the later stages uh, in that phase two, two model of analysis itself becomes a, a question of where and how you do that analysis. Um, so it's like uh, we are looking at some demonstrated uh, projects to sort of align the analysis tools um, in that work package four. But as I say, the, the emphasis is really is, is connecting data and resources through to the analysis uh, environment. Uh, rather than analysis tools themselves. Uh, so there's half a dozen work packages that are described in the work in the plan itself. Uh, and we have a, an emphasis on two different elements of project management, basic project management, but also technical management of the system. Uh, so certainly an emphasis here on a technical architecture that will allow us to connect up uh, different systems and, diff and different technologies and different existing resources. We have a number of well-established social science resources uh, in the community uh, in Australia and internationally. So technical management is, is much about connecting those resources, having a framework for doing so. Then there's some specific work packages. Uh, the two you know, heavy lifting parts are the vocabulary access and management services, or we've entitled VASL, uh, and geospatial, uh, looking at spatial and temporal data integration, bringing together uh, different uh, survey uh, census and other data, spatial data collections uh, in integrated environment, working with uh, with Orin and, and, and UQ in particular in there. Then we've got some demonstrator projects that focus on how do we, you know, how those going to be uh, leveraged within particular domains or partic you know, addressing particular types of problems. Uh, and then uh, two proposed projects around survey data management integration. We touched a little bit on this this morning, talking about bringing uh, content out of existing uh, web-based tools. Uh, and then curation tools for the management and, and, and uh, validation of existing data, uh, data sources. As I, so fundamentally, what we're trying to do is identify what our problems are, suggest solutions oriented around access, governance, sensitive data technologies and information standards uh, with an aim to uh, establish you know, fair data in the first instance, quantitative data uh, as opposed to qualitative data, uh, recognising that those often require uh, different solutions. So looking at how we bring together content together um, and reusable pipelines. And that's where the curation and, and integrate survey research uh, programs uh, might fit together. And, and leveraging both existing and new national research infrastructure technologies. Um, and then as I say, the impact being establishing uh, reference data sets, particularly focusing around the census data. Um, there's a 250 years of census data. So that's one of the, the emphases that we've got here, but both current and, and past census data, uh, but certainly other reference collections. Um, we make pretty heavy use of uh, major data sets in the social sciences. How do, how do we make uh, maximize that use? Um, looking at how do we then feed into policy responses uh, in, the longer, in, in the short and longer term? So how, how does our data uh, and how does our use of data and our use of infrastructure assist in the delivery of social and economic policy, public policy here in Australia? Uh, and then how do we actually maximise the, the return on investment, both for data collected in the research domain, but also in government sources as well, and tying into the national uh, data access and transparency uh, legislation coming out of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Office of the National Data Commissioner at the moment. So, so I'll 
just a quick summary there. I'll then, so I'm happy to open the floor to questions at this point. I think they've started to pop through. Um, let me drop the sharing and I will then uh, throw, open the, throw open the questions. Okay. We've got one from Rob initially. So we've got, um, we've got a question from Sandra Silcott yep. here that says, could you say a few words about how Vassal might relate to ARDC's existing vocabulary services? Uh, yeah, Sandra, so it, it's intended to work directly with the uh, vocabulary services. So what we're really focusing on here um, the, is the how do existing tools, so uh, as an example, how might a survey researcher use the ARDC Research Vocabularies Australia um, to import um, reference metadata um, from the vocabulary services? Uh, and also be able to push content into uh, uh, Research Vocabularies Australia. So it's intended to work um, pretty interactively with those. So you start building up libraries of things like questions, of response domains, of uh, standard classifications is really the emphasis there. Now that does two things. One is it, as I say, it allows us to reuse the metadata that exists, but it should, uh, um, uh, under that framework, also facilitate um, the capacity for machine interoperability going forward. If, if two groups are using the same reference metadata and they're known to be using the same reference metadata, then we have a basis on which to, uh, to bring together both human interoperability, but also machine to machine interoperability going forward. So it's, a, it's, in, it's embedded, a vassal is intended to you know, leverage very much Research Vocabularies Australia. And we've been talking to Adrian Burton and Rowan Bramley about how we might do that. Thanks, Steve. Now we've got, um four questions from Rob Ackland at ANU and Shanika Karunasakira. Apologies for your pronunciation. I'm sure that's not even close. I um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thanks. Okay, so question one. Based on the project plan, it appears that building capacity for social media data is scheduled for phase two rather than phase one. Um, and she's, they say, can you confirm this? Or, and then it's pretty clear that this is correct from the slides just presented just now. So do you want to comment on that, Steve? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rob, that, that's uh, yeah, direct, <laughs> directly the case for two reasons. Um, the, the first one is uh, certainly there's um, the question of just dealing with scaling uh, going forward. We have an 18 month time frame here and how do, how do we, what could we achieve in 18 months was one of the considerations here that um, that the the time frames that we had available to us meant that social media probably we weren't going to be able to get what we needed done within the time and fund budget available so we had to make a decision about where to prioritize the second reason for that and i noticed a couple of the colleagues from qut and yourself are on the call uh is um, some of the some of the existing resources that have already been put in place. ARDC has made some investments recently in this space, and those projects are coming through in the next eighteen months. Uh, so, I think establishing what the the framing might be for requirements for working uh, more actively with social media data, we, that work can be done over the next eighteen months. Um, and that, as I say, really framing up how to make a a more a, a clearer investment in you know as part of the roadmap. Um, a program and building that into that roadmap, uh, road mapping program was our emphasis here, rather than trying to um, squeeze too much in that, as I say, we thought we as I say we thought it's unlikely we'd be able to achieve uh, in the 18 months available to us. Um, question two leads on from that. So given it seems that both Ladaka and Iris and um, Michael will be presenting on Ladaka next but feel free to jump in michael if you want to um, given it seems that both the dacker and iris are planning to include capability for social media data will there be some coordination or sharing of social media data capability between ladaka and iris or mm. are the research community interests considered distinct enough that there won't be any overlap or inefficiency so so I'll start with that and I'll leave it, then I'll turn to Michael af afterwards. So this is one of the questions that I think is really, um, you know, uh, th this is part of the reason I was just, just referring to, is scoping out what are the, the, the communities and the sets of needs and where they might overlap 
is part of that um, scoping activity that actually needs to occur. Um, and I say, we could try and do that as we went, um, but I think, you know, uh, that that deserves a much larger effort because as I say, it seems to me there's a significant investment to be made there and doing the, the, the planning work over the over the the, uh, the period that we're talking about here, uh, and as I say, and Reese has just touched on the other projects that are there, allows us to do that properly and actually you know time the investment correctly within the uh, the larger you know the larger future investment we, we, that we hope will occur uh, and we'd be hoping to contribute to. Michael, did you want to comment on that at this point, or come back to it after you've uh, yeah. in your own session? It's probably useful just to talk about it now, if that's okay with you, Steve. Um, yeah. but was, uh, what's interesting about social media data is it crosses over the humanities and social sciences. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, you know, everyone uses social media data in, in a way. Um, so I, I think our approach in, in LDECA is um, similar, but, but possibly slightly different. So we're trying to engage directly with ARDC funded digital observatory and build working relationships with them. Um, so we're starting a kind of joint office hours across some of the platforms, the, the text analytics platform, digital observatory, and also TLC map. So we're, we're just trying to find ways where we work together and start scoping out the kind of analysis um, landscape. Uh, so uh, obviously we're interested, uh, most interested in text analytics, but actually um, network analytics uh, are quite relevant um, when you're doing work on, on language data. Um, but we prefer uh, the communities and research communities to have, have that expertise, you know, to be working together with them. Um, so I think trying to build up those relationships and, and certainly from our perspective, we see social media and the platforms associated as a beautiful bridge between the work we're doing at the humanities end with language data commons and what you're doing at the social sciences end. So really explicitly a bridge. So we're all on the bridge, right? Um, in terms of um, uh, how, how to engage with the other groups, um, so the, the Digital Observatory project's being led by QT Melbourne and uh, new UNSW. Um, they're the key partners. Um, UQ's in a kind of consultative role on, on that project. Um, and I think in the digital, I don't know if Marissa's here, um, she could actually speak up and say they've been doing the scoping work with the um, social media research community. Um, so they're, you know, it, it, it's probably sensible to get directly in touch with them because that helps us uh, build up the necessary networks that we need. Um, and so, we're not we're not getting out of scope for what we're trying to do with our DACA, I guess. Um, so but we'd lead we'd rather leave leading social media research communities to social media research communities, I guess is, is the conclusion there, but that's helpful. Okay, so flowing on from that, these projects are to be funded under the HAS RDC and Data Commons suggests that data are stored and available to all researchers subject to access rights that may apply to particular collections. How will this work with social media data, for example, Twitter, when the social media platforms place strict conditions on sharing of data collected via APIs? Steve? Uh, yep. That, that's this as I say <laughs> you can see why we didn't start with social media first this is this is a, a core part of the problem Rob as I as you know that um, fundamentally there is work happening in a number of countries that is is think you know this is there's partly a privacy and confidentiality consideration here that is, is associated with social media data sure that's that's one of the issues um, but fundamentally, it's commercial intellectual property rights that I think are much more problematic here. Um, that I've seen, you know, I've seen some work, and I have, you know, some relationships with colleagues in Germany and and in the UK. I think Gasus has done some work here on thinking about archiving of of. So Gasus is the German social science data archive for those on the call um, who have been trying to do some work in this space on understanding what to do about those limitations. Um, uh, Harvard have done some work, for example, on a thing called Social Science One, uh, which is uh, looking at you know, doing direct um, deals with, uh, they did particularly with Facebook, and then they spent two years not being able to get the data out of Facebook. So um, we did, 
we have proposed in the integration activities, this was a discussion that actually happened amongst the, the, the groups, uh, the, the, the groups. So the integration activities partly are thinking about the idea of, well, what are those things that cross over the project? And Michael's touched upon part of the question of how, you know, what those issues are there. One of the things we touched upon in there is both legal frameworks and a roadmap for thinking about those, you know, what, what do we need next? Uh, and this, this is pretty e exemplary of dealing with those sorts of issues. How are, you know, what are the legal considerations we're going to have to deal with before we could get to that point? Um, uh, so there fundamentally needs to be a piece of, uh, in a sense, policy work done to, to bring that discussion along uh, and say, okay, well, what are the, what is it that we, you know, are actually able to make available? Um, how would that be done? And what are the models that are there? Um, bef you know, before we could be housing anything. Um, and as I say, there are a number of folks who are on this call who, who can contribute to that conversation, right? And say, so that would be a, make a very nice, you know, piece of work that would fit within, you know, to me, that would, uh, that would align with that set of activities. Um, I, I, there are the various complexities that, you know, as I say, and I haven't talked at all about the problems of scaling the activities when you start thinking about, you know, processing of social media data um, that, that go on here as well. A, a piece of work that fundamentally, you know, tries to scope up or what, you know, what are the challenges that are there, uh, say, and, and picking up the, you know, uh, those that have been actively involved in this conversation, you know, for a while now, um, um, I think would be fundamentally, a, you know, uh, a very important output to be establishing. And as I say, it's, it, to me, it's not just a social science activity here. It's, it's social science have a, a major part to put, you know, play in that discussion, but it is something that crosses over the, the has domains you know, more generally. Michael, did you want to comment on that? I guess just two, two small points. Um, uh, from an LDAC perspective, um, I, I know people working in, in social media get worried about the archive word because that, that's quite difficult, right? Um, but I, I guess when there's curated sets of users, uh, that's a really, really useful tool. Um, and that, that has been done in Australia, right? So the Australian Twitter collection is essentially a, a curated set of users. Um, so that's useful. Um, the big challenge is uh, version control um, and also the ability to, to be able to do his, historical work, to go back in time with the social media. We, we really want to be able to do that. So I guess that's um, our, our stake in it, perhaps, uh, from the language side to see. Thank you. Um, and Rob, I will go on to question four, even though you've said happy for us to bypass it because I think it's interesting. So what plans do you have for engaging with research groups in Australia who specialise in services and tools that enable researchers to conduct large scale real time social media data collection via APIs and also provide analysis tools, for example, RAPID at University of Melbourne and BOSON at ANU. Uh, as I say, I, I, I think that needs to be part of that, that integrated discussion fundamentally. I'd like to actually bring a working group together to do some of that planning work fundamentally. Um, so as I say, I, I think we could count amongst those that are already here, um, uh, uh, a starting group for, for how we might establish that. Uh, I think we saw a similar uh, discussion on preservation questions uh, in, the, in the previous discussion here. But as I say, if, as I, I think bringing together that group, trying to get um, that planning work done, um, how we support that within the AODC program. Um, Jenny, but so I'd say you let me know how you want to further that conversation, <laughs> I guess, fundamentally. Um, but I, I say to me, it's a critical thing that, that needs to happen. Where we fit with that within the program, I guess, is that is really the question that um, uh, that we'd want to explore. But, you know, I, so we've had some initial discussions um, with, uh, I was meeting with uh, some of the folks from the Centre for Automated Decision Making who, you know, partly cover off some of the QUT uh, team here as well. Um, but we had to say, we haven't gone into detail there, but as I, I think putting that forward and, and figuring out how we fit that into this program, you know, would be a good output coming out of that integration discussion. Sure. Can I make a comment, Jenny? Yes. 
Um, yeah, thanks, um, Michael and Steve, for the responses. Um, I just feel that um, <clears throat> this social media data are such a, an um, interesting and important source of data for both social sciences and humanities. And as as the discussions just as we've just heard, it's unclear how they fit across the humanities and the social sciences, or that both mm -hmm. both sets of communities have got uh, a stake in them. Um, I guess I'm just putting it out to the ARDC that, you know, maybe there is a need to fast track this in some ways. I'm, I'm a bit concerned to hear that um, I understand why it's being pushed back for all the reasons that Steve mentioned, but it kind of concerns me that we may not be having concerted efforts to develop capabilities or, or should I say support existing capabilities and expand them um, from beyond to, to 2023. It just seems... Um, quite far in the future, but I completely understand why it's happening this way, because I think LDACA and, and, um, and IRIS are kind of have got core business in other areas in terms of other data sources. Um, and, and in some ways, the social media data are interesting, but they're a bit sort of uh, not core business in some ways. And so I can understand why the effort and the uh, has to be um, made towards these other data sources and other research communities. But the concern I have is that Social media is it's an evolving, growing space. And you know, Steve's already mentioned Internet of Things. That's even expanding it even further. And I guess I, I my question is maybe there is a need to somehow fast track this through another project, or I, I guess I just put it back to the ARDC. So thanks for your time. Jenny, can I come in on that as well? Sure. Kylie Brass from the Academy of the Humanities. I agree, and I wonder whether, I mean, you know, and it's it's Jenny's position and, and obviously Rosie's as well to sort of think through how this, I mean, obviously there's a program of work underway here. The beauty of what Jenny's achieving at the moment is capturing that capability that isn't part of, I guess, this first phase of, of projects. And that's like a gap, a big gap. I wonder who has mandate, you know, in, in a way to kind of like drive that agenda. And I think there is crossover totally with what Steve's doing. I don't think it belongs with Steve's work totally, nor do I think it belongs with LDACA, although it, mm. it, there is crossover there. Obviously, there's been a bunch of work happening at QUT. I mean, that's been a, a, a major sort of epicenter of that work and and the other place I would single out is um and I'm sorry for you because I'm not I'm not picking up but I'm, I'm just talking about what I'm familiar with I guess in the landscape um you know with the work of Axel Bruins and Jean Burgess and 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 whatnot but also with ADMS so the Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society and I think one thing that I think has got to happen is that this finds its way into the roadmap you know so in a way it's the sort of, so yes, I think there's, it's, it would be brilliant for a space in this program to, you know, identify some of that stuff that's not, and, and it is cross-cutting, it's not owned by any one project, but it's, you know, it's something to, to scope and, and, and prioritise in some shape of, and, and form, but also for this program of work to feed that into the roadmap, which is, I know, something that you're keen to do as well. So I think they want to, would want to hear that. Thanks, Kylie. Maybe, um, can I add just one point? Um, so I, I'd probably push back slightly um, against the idea, Steve, that we're waiting until 23 or 24 to do the social media thing. Actually, it's happening right now. Um, so QT is working with Melbourne and UNSW on a national platform for social media. It's actually happening right now. They're, they're mm -hmm. doing that work. I can't speak for them. Um, I think they're best speaking for themselves. Um, when we're thinking about a roadmap, um, it's pretty clear that the government, when they're wanting to invest, they're looking at you know readiness uh, and so on. So part of readiness is that there's a clear pulling together of past uh, and current investments in this kind of area. Um, so it strikes me that there's, uh, that there's a lot of work, or maybe not so much work, um, but bringing together social media researchers who have these kind of investments and capabilities, coming together and, and putting forward, uh, you know, the next phase of investment. I, I, I think that's the kind of discussion. And we're, we're happy to be involved because we see a, a kind of 
linking over. Uh, but it's not because we don't think it's important. It's, it's just mm -hmm. simply out of deference to the expertise of social media researchers that we're not trying to lead in the space. Um, I think it's incredibly important. I would love to see some more APIs and trove to some of the, uh, the data there, but as we've heard, it may not happen this time around. So it's not, we don't think it's important. We think it's absolutely important, but it is really a difference to the people who should be leading this kind of work. Um, so you know, we're really happy you're here today, um, mm. joining in and joining in the discussion, raising the issues. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair summary, Michael. I, I, and I guess I was talking specifically on behalf of Iris there to, you know, to touch on that, which is, as I, it was a pretty clear, you know, as I, I, I knew the question would be coming, so that's kind of why I wanted to frame this discussion very early on, that there is, you know, it's a question of, you know, fundamental question of capacity as well um, within the within the context of what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I, I would concur with what Michael's saying there. There is some pretty active work that's going on there um, and as I say, I think we could, you know, sort of extend, you know, Rob's earlier question about how to bring that group together. I think we could bring that to get group together fairly effectively. Uh, and again, I think it's right. It's, it's neither Michael or myself with other, you know, the, the obvious people to lead that discussion. It's, it's actually, you know, as Kylie touched on, it's, it's what is the, you know, has more broadly consideration. That was, all, that was always part of the the challenge we have is oh, where does it fit here? It fits everywhere, and, and which makes it hard to fit it anywhere is, is part of the problem. Um, so that's, you know, thinking about that work and doing a you know really good policy and, and planning piece there. I think, again, that, that would be my position. Um, I think that Rosie Hicks has got her hand raised. So we mm. might see what Rosie has to say. Um, lovely, thanks, Jenny. Uh, just checking I'm not on mute. Um, sorry for jumping in, but I think it's terribly important when we're using the word roadmap uh, to be really careful about the definition here. Um, we've spoken about a roadmap for a particular project activity uh, over the course of the day, and they're, they're very important things. Um, the, the question we're looking at here in the notes, are there any capability gaps um, can this be incorporated into the roadmap? I want us to be really careful to understand that the ARDC um, has no control over what goes into the national uh, research infrastructure roadmapping uh, or roadmap. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got an expert working group working on that at the moment. However, um, we absolutely can feed this in as part of our submissions and response to an exposure draft. And I'm, I'm delighted to do that because I want to make one other uh, really important point. It would have been possible to just fund four completely separate projects. Um, we're hearing from four projects today. They could have been completely disconnected. What you are doing as a community today um, is an absolutely fantastic step forward in addressing this as um, a whole of sector activity. And the, the real gems in this are the things that come about uh, because they are at the edges, because they do overlap, uh, because they are in danger of falling through the cracks. Uh, so you know, please take it from me that we're delighted to have these issues brought to the fore today um, and uh, it's exactly what a national research infrastructure is able to achieve that we don't do any other way. Thanks Jenny. Thanks Rosie. Okay. Right, just follow up quickly on that Jenny um, which I mean Rosie's point is absolutely correct to so say we don't we don't you know they, they say with when I talk about a road like we, we talk, have talked in the integration activities about the idea of a roadmap for the has and, and indigenous um, as a as a piece of work to what does this thing kind of need to do that's is actually you know separate from but should feed into that broader national research infrastructure roadmap so you're right the language matters here and distinguishing quite what we talk about there is is important there um what I would say to, to, to those who are on this call here is you say you will get the opportunity for feedback into the national research uh, infrastructure roadmap going forward 
uh, you know, the timing is, you know, the, the exposure draft is coming soon. So say the capacity to feed into that program is, is, um, uh, is there uh, as well um, in, in the near future. To say we don't quite know what the date of that specifically is, but responding to the exposure draft and pointing out this is a capability gap might be a good thing to be doing in that, you know, in your responses there, uh, be one part to be in there. But certainly I think within the, the, the constraints of the, the, the Hassan Indigenous program, we, we are keen to kind of have a, um, where's the shared roadmap for, for us uh, within that, uh, those constraints as well. Thanks. Okay, really quickly, because we've only got five minutes, but um, Paul Gruber says, love your work. One criteria is where possible project plans should improve opportunities for Australian researchers working on challenges that impact our region, including the ability mm -hmm. for Australian collections and research to work in partnership with our Pacific neighbours. Is it possible at this point to build such Pacific partnerships at these early stages? That is, I'm concerned about a focus on US and European links here that may preclude future Pacific partnerships. Uh, okay, so yes, it would be. I mean, I, I would say one of the challenges here is that the infrastructure, the you know, partly that we're talking about here does not exist in some countries, like, or it is very, you know, so, so I work a lot with groups in Indonesia, uh, in Taiwan, in, uh, to a less extent, Singapore, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a very big jump between these places to say it's, they have bigger problems to be dealing with. Um, that said, how do, how do we support capability building across that region? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, similarly, I say one of the we ha we haven't figured out. We, we're working quite closely with colleagues in New Zealand. As I say, I, it, you know, as the, the simplest example of you know of that, um, there aren't a lot of investments at the infrastructure level in this space in the country, you know, across the Pacific region that we're talking about here. But certainly, we have some connections that we can draw upon there. Uh, and that question about capability building across the region and then possibly how do Australian researchers work in those regions actually use some of the infrastructure. Um, ADA has actually got quite a lot of experience in doing that, uh, in fact, and you know, we, we can kind of draw upon that. There are networks that exist, but it's, as I say, it's, it would largely be in the area of capacity and capability building as, a, 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 as opposed to partnering on directly on infrastructure itself. It's, uh, in a number of the countries that we might be interested in, it's just not there, you know, frankly. And so it's often provided from, you know, other locations, but, you know, um, should be part of the, you know, should be part of the discussion is something we've done for quite a long time. Great. Thanks, Steve. Okay, so we've only got five minutes left. Um, so I might give Steve an opportunity to make any summing up remarks that he might want to make at this point. Uh, yeah, so I, I think at this point, I say it, it's certainly that we've, we've got our, our plans out there, and we're certainly keen to talk to anyone who, who's interested uh, going forward. We've we brought a number of partners along the discussion, a number of who, who, whom are here today, uh, and certainly if you have an interest in, in this going into the future, um, yeah, we're really keen to see um, both. I say in, in the short term, your responses to the the. The, the work packages and the plan that we've put together for now. But as I say, I'm very keen on thinking, you know, uh, three, five, you know, years ahead, what do we need to be, you know, feeding into our planning into the future? And I think we've had a, a good long discussion about, you know, a couple of those possibilities already today. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, you know, how you might use this infrastructure, you know, where partnering might occur uh, or, uh, you know, uh, commentary on the, the plan itself, you know, we look forward to that response and uh, uh, look forward to working with people into the future. Thanks. So yes, a reminder that we will leave the question register open. So please feel free to continue to add questions. Um, and I'll make sure that Steve is aware of that and we get them answered for you. Um, don't forget the feedback submission due on the 27th of September. I think we are all looking forward to receiving your feedback. So is anybody else got any remarks before we move on? in a couple of minutes to the language data commons of Australia project. Nope. Okay. Well, we may just wait for a minute or two. So if somebody wants to sing or 
or share a talent <laughs> because um, we have advertised the time. So I do want to go up on time so that if people want to listen to Michael, they get that opportunity. Um, Paul says, can we draw India in our plans in any way? So just a final. And can you expand on that, in, um, <laughs> Paul? In I mean, one that, minute that's, or that's, less. That's, that's, that's not a small question. It may not have oh, to no, I just, uh, <laughs> I was concerned that India is one of our major partners, and I was just wondering, and they have a huge IT capability, I was thinking. We as AD are uh, in as a, nash, a nation, um, you know, why, how can we draw in India, I suppose, and, and leverage a lot of India researchers and, and the uh, India infrastructure, I was thinking. Um, there's a lot of talent in India. So. Uh, certainly on the IT side of the equation there. And as I say, we do work with, uh, we've got a couple of comparative research projects that include India as a, a site there. I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, certainly on the development capabilities, there, there might be some possibilities there. As a site for social science research, it's, 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 it's not one thing fundamentally, I think is the question that's there. It's a bit like working with, as I say, with Indonesia, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, the breadth, both the size of the population, the breadth of activities that have happened there uh, makes it make for some interesting challenges there. But uh, I, it seems like I'd say partnering in the different parts of the, of the region would be um, worthwhile furthering the conversation, I think. Yeah, I guess my, my spirit of it was because these are pilot programs, it'd be nice to start building in this early on before we kind of forget about it later on and, and you know, strengthen existing relationships at the expense of building capacity and capability with our neighbors and trading partners. So that's all. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Steve. And thank you everyone for contributing questions to that session. So we're gonna move on now to our final um, project plan session. And um, as I said, at the end of the day, we'll regroup for a um, group discussion. So developing the language data commons of Australia. This platform will capitalize on existing infrastructure rescue vulnerable and dispersed collections and link with improved analysis environments for new research outcomes. And uh, representing the DACA today, we have Dr. Michael Hoare, Michael, Marco Farmi, you know, Professor Michael Hoare is what I probably should have said. Um, both of those things anyway, Marco Farmi and Dr. Peter Sefton. Michael is Professor of Linguistics and Applied Linguistics in the School of Languages and Cultures at UQ and is our project lead. Marco is the Program Manager of LADACA and the Australian Text Analytics Platform. Um, and Peter is the technical lead of LADACA and the Australian Text Analytics Platform, which is also known as ATAP, uh, just in case you needed another acronym today. <laughs> anyway, I will hand over to Michael, who will give us a bit of background about the project. And thanks a lot, Jenny. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the lands from which I'm joining you today, the, the lands of the Yaga and Durrigal peoples up in uh, Queensland. Um, and uh, I don't want to give a, another project summary, but I just wanted to share two slides to give a bit of context uh, to the LDECA has RDC project um, that, that perhaps weren't apparent in, in, in the project plan, which was a bit more focused. So I'll, I'll just share that. Um, and as I share, I also wanted to, to give a shout out to some of the other LDECA team members who are here as well uh, in, in the room. Uh, they're very welcome. Uh, to speak up and uh, uh, add, add to what I'm saying here. Um, so just, just to give a bit of context, um, we're talking about this project here, the Language Data Commons of Australia has Research Data Commons project. So the LDECA has RDC project. Um, this, is, this is death by acronyms here, right? Um, but I think what's important uh, to understand with this particular project uh, plan is it has it's actually building on a number of past and, and current co-investments. Um, so I won't go into all, all, all the sort of past ones, but the current co-investments uh, would be 
four actually that are quite relevant to this one. Um, so there's an investment in the Australian text analytics platform, uh, which has a remit which goes uh, well beyond language scientists into, into HASS and even outside of HASS, uh, researchers wanting to use text analytics. Uh, we have a Language Data Commons of Australia Data Partnerships project, which is starting to uh, you know, pilot how we bring together all of these different institutions uh, with, with all of the different technical and governance and so on frameworks. Um, there's the Ninga platform, uh, which is an ARC LEAF project, which Nick Tiberger is, is leading, which is working uh, with primary uh, source materials, manuscripts and so on, and, and making them uh, more uh, usable and available to researchers and communities. And finally, there's an Indigenous-led research on Indigenous languages uh, project uh, where we're partnering with um, uh, we're trying to increase the capacity of uh, Indigenous researchers involved in, in this area and in this project. So it's kind of coming together. And of course, as Steve mentioned, uh, phase two or for us phase three uh, is the, the sort of national roadmap and, and wanting to, to obviously have, have a footprint in that. Um, and if I was going to summarize what we're trying to do in the project in very, very simple terms, um, it's really about finding language data. So um, Language data is often hard to find because it's scattered across different places. So an example would be, um, so for a particular indigenous language, um, there may be records of it that have been collected by linguists, by anthropologists, by oral historians, and by missionaries, um, just for instance. So there's concrete examples of those. And people have, have put that data in different places, basically. So for a community or a researcher who's trying to understand and get hold of data, it's all over the place. So this is, this is a big issue, finding the data, um, increasing reusability. Um, so even when you find the data, it may not be in a form that's easy to use. So a very simple example would be in Trove, um, they've done OCR on, on some uh, language data, but of course we all know OCR makes mistakes. Um, when it's English data, you can use spell check and it's like that, right? But when you're dealing with other language uh, data, you don't have a spell check uh, for some of the Australian Indigenous languages, right? Um, and so uh, LDAC is about, um, for instance, providing uh, tools so you can, you know, use, using an L NLP uh, to be a applying spell check to those collections to, to fix up those OCR mistakes. So that's just about increasing usability of the data. Then of course, this is something we hear a lot um, uh, constantly. I would say every time we're engaging with indigenous uh, stakeholders, it's, it's about repurposing language data. Uh, so linguists uh, have often been using language data for description. Um, Communities are not so interested in linguistic description. Um, they're wanting to repurpose their data to contribute to the cultural intellect of, of their communities and so on. So that, that's kind of the broader context. Um, I guess the second thing is we're really um, keen on building up an ecosystem. And we, we see this as uh, the way we talk about it as a 10 year project, um, 2032 is actually where we're thinking about. Um, this coincides with the decade of Indigenous languages, uh, UN, uh, decade of Indigenous languages. So we really see this as a stepwise progression, building up capacity uh, amongst researchers and communities, uh, getting access to data and tools and so on. Um, so one way of thinking about uh, this is that uh, there's been a lot of work here. I'm, 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 this is, you know, uh, flattery, uh, since, uh, uh, copying things is, you know, the serious form of flattery type of thing. This is from Australian BioCommons, just if someone recognises this, it might be eerily familiar. So I've, I've converted into terms that make sense, I think, to humanity scholars. Um, so in, in the BioCommons, there's the wet lab. Uh, so our equivalent is we have archival and fieldwork humanities. People go out and, and they, they're digging into it. Um, but there's also a kind of public humanities arm to things, um, which you know, communities are interested in, in their own data and what's going on with it. Um, and I guess, um, particularly in the language sciences, there's been the growth of what you might call data-driven humanities, uh, where people are analyzing data collections and that's a critical contributor to research outcomes, but it's not the sole driver of it. Um, so there's still a lot of qualitative interpretive work going on. Um, what's starting to emerge is what we might call data-intensive humanities, uh, where the research is fully dependent on advanced data intensive analytics. Um, and then finally, 
uh, these are these people who are like gold. Um, I think they're called bioinformaticians. Uh, um, I, I, I think we could dub them humanities informaticians, uh, where they're really working at the high end of things. Uh, there's very few people like this in Australia and indeed not so many around the world. Uh, I think they're all hired by Google and co. They pay a lot more money than universities could ever pay. Um, so they, these are really precious people for us. And of course, this feeds back into the kinds of things uh, where people are, are dipping into the archives. So we, our, our aim, I think, with LDACA is really trying to, to work across the whole range of users. Um, and although we, we talk about things like machine learning and APIs and so on, uh, we really have in mind uh, the long tail of researchers who are actually working here a lot of the time in the wet labs and, and perhaps dipping their toes into data driven. And, and so we, we progress along. And we've seen that with Australian Biocommons. It's very successful in terms of uh, shifting the kinds of research uh, that can, can, can be done in addition to traditional um, sort of biological environmental science research, which doesn't stop because you still obviously have to go out to the field. Um, so I just was wanting to give a bit of context. Um, I'm assuming you have re read the research plan. Um, so if, if you haven't, then quickly have a read now. But we're, we're really looking forward to your questions. And uh, I'm just clicking across my questions yet. Um, very welcome to raise questions either in, in the um, text box or just verbally if you want to ask us questions. And all the difficult questions will go to Marco and Peter. And uh, I think Nick is here as well. So, uh, yeah. Has anybody got any questions for Michael, Marco, Peter, or Nick? Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll quickly answer it and then I'm sure Peter's going to give a much more eloquent answer. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the reason we didn't include it in our um, project plan was uh, it would have taken a lot of space to explain it. Um, and we didn't want to put something out there that would, would, would just raise more confusion than anything. Um, but I believe, Peter, you're presenting the architecture model at eResearch conference in, in October. Um, so that'd be a, a public way. And of course, you can obviously contact us as well. So Peter, do you want to? Uh, yes, it will be made available. So we've been focusing on building a prototype, um, but the, the um, yes, it'll be public soon. Okay, look, uh, I can ask uh, a, a question, and I'm not sure whether it's entirely relevant to the program that you're doing, uh, except uh, that there has been an enormous amount of relatively recent research on the diversity of Australian Indigenous languages. There have been relatively few really comprehensive, for example, dictionaries uh, produced. Now, in the case of language which, which are spoken well by a large number of people, those kind of dictionaries are important sort of adjuncts, both for the relearning of language, but also the maintenance of it, and also the translation of text and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking in particular, say, for example, of the Yonga Matter Dictionary, which is already something that is online, which is excellent, but was produced by uh, um, out of uh, hard, uh, you know, uh, word dictionaries that were produced 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and it seems to me that it would be a good idea to target some of those areas where there are Indigenous languages which have very large uh, communities uh, of continuing speakers and build uh, into those resources that are more current uh, than the ones that exist. So in a sense, it's sort of surveying the nature of the indigenous community in relation to the repurposing that in fact you were talking about and that the use of those uh, into very different kind of categories according to the nature of digital resources that might help the trajectory that's happening at this moment in time. That's my... <laughs> I think that's Nick Tiber is gonna jump. <laughs> yeah, oh, um, it's, it's a really pertinent question to almost everything we're talking about. This is research that's gone into creating dictionaries 
And dictionary is a great example of something that needs to be renewed periodically every, you know, 10 years or whatever, I mean, as Howard says. Um, and, you know, a repository like, I don't know, there could be a repository somewhere in Australia that could store digital data from dictionaries, Australian language dictionaries. So when I worked at IATSIS, we ran a dictionaries project and asked people to deposit the files. So this was back in the days of CPM and DOS. Um, and, you know, that those files could then be reused and repurposed in different ways because they came from structured data for dictionaries. So, you know, absolutely, um, this is something that needs to be done. Um, LDACA isn't going to be a repository um, primarily. It's going to be a, a sort of platform and access to existing repositories. But IATSIS would be a logical place where digital data of this kind should be stored. IATSIS is currently running a, a dictionaries, a well-funded dictionaries project, but as I understand it, they're not requiring the digital data to be stored. They're only funding the production of books. Yeah, yeah. And look, I can link this back into the previous discussion that we had about social media, because again, if you look at uh, Northeast Arnhem Land, and uh, if you look at literacy in Yolngu language, uh, there are very, very few books, works, even sort of pamphlets being produced now. More were being produced 40 years ago than there are today. But the social media use of Yolngu language is absolutely everywhere. So there's an enormous resource now about language as it is being spoken and used that could, if one would be able to link that in to that process, of, if you like, sort of updating dictionary production language uh, uses there, be an extraordinarily beneficial thing. So again, a slightly lateral comment, but I mean, I think it is something that is looking towards the affordances provided by digital media, if one can overcome uh, a whole series of sort of, uh, you know, problems of permissions and so on and so forth. Thank you. Okay, um, a question from Rob Ackland. Michael, in your earlier comments, you mentioned linguists have an interest in social network data, online networks or otherwise. Can you please expand on this comment? Do you see that current partners can provide this capability or is this more for phase two? And I think by phase two, Rob probably means post June, 2023. Yeah, I, so I, I guess linguists are like everyone in the humanities and social scientists and, and see social media as a, as a really rich uh, data source uh, for studying language and changes in, in language. Um, and it's quite interesting because, you know, traditional social linguistics, which focuses on, you know, traditional social linguistics variables like gender and, and, and age and all these kind of things it is obviously really different in online communities and so that's where network anal analytics are absolutely vital to understanding what's going on there and we know there's uh, groups uh, overseas in, in Finland and others who are doing real interesting work in the space which we'd like to learn from you know for the linguists right um, so I, I don't think the linguists are any anything special uh, in terms of being interested in social media data, but like everyone else, um, trying to build up capability to access it, um, you know, grab the data, work with it, work with it ethically and so on, right? Not just you know, grabbing is not the right term, uh, being, but being able to access it and get it into forms where you can analyze it. So I think there's a lot of similarities, although I think one of the differences I've noticed is uh, probably linguists might see uh, social media not so much through the network analytics, but as just a big chunk of uh, language use. Uh, and for us, that's that's really big data, uh, obviously, because it's, it's massive amounts. Um, so I don't know, that, that helps. So I, I think there's a lot of uh, synergies and possibilities uh, there. Um, but I, I, I would uh, caution that probably uh, the kind of tools we're looking for are probably at the simpler end uh, than perhaps what, um, social media researchers at the top end of town are doing. I mean, we're just looking for some, some basic tools uh, to get into it. 
um, you know, beyond the copying and pasting from Twitter pages and all sorts of horrible things that humanities researchers still do. Um, and so the current partners can provide this capability. Um, but I, I think, as I said before, I think there's a lot of value in, um, in, in your group and Shanika's group uh, working together with um, some of the other uh, currently funded, uh, through AODC funded uh, projects. And I think working together with the uh, Center of Excellence for Automation, I would say with the Language Data Commons, uh, the Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language, CODAL, are really paid, played a really pivotal role in supporting what we're doing. So being able to connect in with the Center of Excellence is, is, is a really good way of showing that national spread. Uh, but I just can't comment on that capability. Of, of yeah, the if I may just um, comment back. Um, yeah, I was actually not just referring to social media networks. I was yeah. talking about social network data more generally. Like okay. I, I um, <clears throat> so to what extent might social network analysis as a subfield actually, I know it's um, how it may actually um, build, be built into the cap capabilities of LDACA. Um, but, um, but, also, just a comment that um, with regard to um, you made the comment that linguists tend to think of social media data as it's more a text source of text, um, and and then you referred to that that then leads to big data techniques for kind of um, analysing text from a I guess a computational linguistics um, perspective. But what I'm getting at is that there is an interest in knowing not only um, you know what text is being produced on social media but who is actually producing the text who's who's authoring it you know and and how are they positioned uh, you know on twitter for example or in social networks more generally like are they in a position of power of, of some way and that's where social network analysis and measures of network centrality are, are relevant so i guess like I, I i'm just continuing on with my theme that um there's kind of additional capacity and capabilities in Australia in this area and, and it's I'm very keen to make sure that we can connect in with what's going on so thank you. Just to add a little bit to what Rob says with RAPID we did work with the US Army they had a grant specifically in the language area they were interested in looking at code switching in the uh, social network to identify how people code switch to get their uh, ideas across so we have built in capabilities for language tracking in that context. So if anybody is interested, it's available at the moment. Yeah, that, 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 that's super exciting. Um, I mean, I, I think maybe just echoing what Rosie was saying. I mean, this is the great thing about coming together and we can see the sort of capabilities. So I, I think we're aware of, of the power and importance of our social network analytics, um, but there's less specific expertise in our group uh, on that. Um, so we're really keen to connect in because, you know, bringing these things together is, is going to be very powerful. Um, but as I said, it, it, we really need to be building off uh, kind of current investments as well, uh, of which there are some. So, uh, Yeah, I, I agree. I, I know there are current investments, but those current investments may not be in the area. Social media analysis takes different forms. And so the, the people, for example, at QUT may not be doing social network analysis or may not be focusing on networks as such. Um, and so that therefore brings in a different set of tools and a different capabilities. So I, I, guess, I guess I'm trying to take the opportunity of this forum to just indicate that there's a diversity of researchers working in this space um, who have been funded by the ARC, who are part of current plans for centers of excellence oh, sorry. and so um uh, yep so looking forward to continuing that conversation thank you um kylie brass says michael can you say something more about work package 4.2 the process for developing strategic partnerships with key national stakeholders especially glam ray a uh, joint roadmap for long-term preservation? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Kylie, and I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked it, and I'm, I'm not surprised you've got a, a, an interest in that one. Um, so I guess one, one of the tricky things with, with LDACA is, um, because it's a funded project with an end date, 
Um, it's not like we can set up a long-term repository because we don't, we don't have funding to do that. And I think, I think the consensus is um, really the answer is working across GLAM or at least the LAM bit of it, right? So the libraries, archives and museums, uh, they're long-term long custodians. Um, in our view, um, of course, university libraries are a part of that, um, but there's, there's obviously some real gaps between what we need uh, in terms of long-term preservation of language data and what libraries are currently doing in archives and museums. Um, so perhaps our approach, and we'd, we'd really welcome the advice of the advisory panel on this, because there's uh, a bit of expertise in this area, right? About how we might do this. Um, but, but our view is, is a kind of ground up approach is best. Um, so rather than top down and trying to do the whole nation, uh, which is not going to happen in 18 months and would just be too difficult. We think a ground up approach where we're starting to work across some selected ones. So um, some uh, selected university libraries. So we're, we're targeting Queensland right now just because that's where we've got some context. So some, some of the university libraries uh, try to connect in with the state library, try to connect in with state archives. And there's also some museums which hold data and just start to explore how um, you might be able to work across those. So one, one issue is around the, the format of the data and is it preservable digital objects of, of, of which I think Peter and Nick would have a lot to say. Um, but there's also just finding the data and finding the data could be as simple as just applying standard kind of metadata codes like OSLANG to the data and, and getting uh, uh, those, those archives on board. So that that's, and just starting the discussion. So we'd like to, to be talking with the, um, the Association of University Libraries uh, about how they're seeing this issue of research data and their responsibility. Um, we, we see language data as kind of a cultural data. So there's a, a bit more of an imperative than them holding on to you know, a bunch of astronomy numbers or whatever, um, which obviously they'd be a bit worried about. Whereas language data is here forever, right? Um, we wanna keep it forever. Um, so that, that does seem to be potentially within the remit of libraries, and, 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 but it's just working that through. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I saw you on that, Jill. So, uh, specific suggestions and feedback are really welcome on that point. Thank you. Okay, Tim Sherritt asks Does the integration of Blinder Hub into the Australian Text Analytic Platform? mean that you'll be creating a local instance of Blinder Hub? And if so, will this be open to uses and users beyond ATAP? That's a good question, but I'm gonna to defer to Peter. Um, so we, we are currently reviewing the, um, the platforms, Binder Hub and others, um, to work out what's the most appropriate uh, technology to use. I'm not an expert in this, but we have people working with um, our team at Arnet and surveying what's available. Um, uh, ATAP will be available to everybody um, and this is all based on open source software and one of the primary um, primary goals for everything we're doing is to make sure that any analytics pipeline um, will be as reusable as possible. It's probably not possible to, to absolutely guarantee that but we want to take great care to make sure that we have fully described research objects um, that can have some hope of working outside of any particular platform. But we don't know what whether it's Binder Hub or not. Thank you. Um, right, so we've got from Paul Gruber, um, Ray Work Package 4.4, Stepwise Capacity Building of Australian Language Researchers a series of engagement and training workshops, online training modules and research support for researchers working with text. Can undergraduate students in a sense be included? That is, can materials be made authorable, modifiable so that teaching academics can use it in their own local BA degree programs, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I think probably the answer is absolutely. Um, because LDAC is an open science uh, community, um, and I think it's also in our contract 
that the uh, it's supposed to be national, right? Uh, so we can't just keep it for small groups. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there'd be some kind of, I don't think it's particularly important in an undergraduate classroom, but there's some kind of citation uh, kind of things. But yeah, no, absolutely, that, that would be the idea. I mean, we can't run the workshops, obviously, for the undergrads. Um, we can run them for the researchers, but yeah, the researchers grab them, bring them into their classrooms, get the younger you know, scholars on board with us early. That's perfect, right? That's, that's kind of the stepwise change. Um, Indeed, it is. Uh, okay, just looking at capability gaps. Just a couple of comments that they've got some gaps in storing social media records in Indigenous languages um, and gaps that we've already discussed in um, the development of dictionaries. Okay. Are there any uh, further questions for Michael or his team? Are there any more gaps, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, well, items for the wish list, Res Reese says. Yeah, and um, someone's writing perennity. That's, yes. This, this is <laughs> this is the biggie. That's the really age-old <laughs> the, the age perennity problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're really, really keen on that happening. Um, so yeah, that's one of our goals to, to keep plugging away at that issue. Um, I, I guess that's the best way we can put it. Um, but I, I do think when we're responding to the NCRIS uh, draft roadmap, that will be something we'll be raising that um, an NCRIS capability must provide this kind of long-term uh, sort of uh, storage and preservation of high value collections, uh, because otherwise, I mean, that's, that's core to the NCRIS capability. Rosie's gonna speak up. Um, Michael, this is such a topical uh, discussion. It, it's so important across um, every area of research. And so if I may, I'd really like to, to first comment and then ask uh, another question. NCRIS capabilities are finite. We don't know that we exist beyond 30th of June, 2023. Um, obviously, my day job is to do my very best to make that happen. Um, but it is the same for all NCRIS capabilities. And indeed, how can we create new national research infrastructures if we're not prepared to close old ones? And with that in mind, um, I don't think NCRIS capabilities are the answer but I do want us to be really clear about what we think the answer should be. Um, and I, I, you know, I have conversations with Desi and I say, that's fine. Just commit to funding us uh, to 2050 and researchers will feel that that is, uh, and even if, no, I'm actually, I mean, I say it jokingly, but I'm being um, perhaps not in, entirely uh, flippant by saying if you choose to fund ARDC to provide this capability to 2050 then you've got a reasonable answer but I can't see that happening very easily so what do we do about it I mean this this is one of the biggest questions right now and um, I think it was, was a great thing to be discussing just fix the whole thing for us here Mike. so, <laughs> so I, I I guess the involvement and maybe, I don't know if someone from Trove is here, would, would like to speak as, as one of the key stock stakeholders and, and you know, GLAM. Um, but if we see um, Trove as part of our increased capability, which I think we are, then uh, Trove National Library and all, all the libraries and archives and museums, they're the long-term custodians um, especially for humanities type of data, uh, it's a really natural fit. Um, so trying to find a way for us to bridge the gap between the sort of public facing mandate of GLAM institutions and the obviously the research focused uh, aims of NCRIS capability. I think that's the magic um, sort of bringing together where 
we're trying to aim for here. Uh, I, I would say an increased capability which has a seven year um, investment timeline is a whole lot better than oh, yeah. or two years. Um, but yeah, um, libraries are, are longer, but T, T and do you wanna? Uh, it's me actually. Oh, you sorry, just got yeah. me. Tegan is on some incredibly well deserved, but nowhere near as exciting as she hoped to leave. Um, look, I might need to repeat. I'm not going to repeat the whole little bit from before, but for those who may not have been present, I take the point, but, I mean, one thing is the National Library is not and has not for a really long time, my entire career really, been in a position to pick up and store and manage projects um, and services that have been created by this community as an ongoing. We do have some responsibility for published material and also manuscript material, which overlaps with the linguists a bit because that's where most of your data is, right? But that's not true of other disciplines either. So even I think in an environment where we had different kinds of funding, we are unlikely given our current role and articulation of that role to pick up responsibility for data sets that don't cross over with our collections in an innate way, which as I said, for some of these communities they do and for some they don't. Um, I don't, we aren't going to be the catch-all and the solution to the long-term sustainability. As much as my beating heart says I'd love it if we got a different mandate and a different way of set up. And I think the National Library would be a great location. It happens internationally, but that isn't the environment that we're working within. So yes, all I can say is I don't think that's the magic bullet either. I think they're really hard questions. Personally, personal statement, again, not from my institution. My career has largely been marked by seeing some fantastic projects which have died because they haven't been able to be sustainable, right? Um, it is the 20th anniversary right this week of Ausplit, um, which is a wonderful initiative and a fantastic thing. Ausplit was one of seven projects that were funded in that round, and I think there's only two of those that still exist. So it is a significant issue for this community to not to continue to build things that can't be sustained. And yeah, it, it, the library won't come in and be the white knight on this one. Where we can get stuff into Trove, I think we will maintain Trove and we will start to guarantee that we can, what's in Trove will be maintained into the long term. It's gonna be a bit of a shift in our space too. Um, I noticed that there's a couple of people with hands raised, but I just want to uh, go back to a question from Nick, and I'm going to ask Rosie Hicks to address this. So Nick says, can ARDC not be the advocate for a national data service that guarantees long-term and ongoing curation of research data? Um, thanks, Jenny. I did put a note in the chat for, for Nick there as well. Um, I am very comfortable um, going into the exposure draft saying that this is a national um, requirement. I, I think this is very, very straightforward. Um, the, and, and I would go back to Nick's uh, comment just prior to that, uh, European research funding can go for 15, 20, uh, 50 years. And note, you know, if we look at Zenodo, that's not the answer to our, our problems, but um, CERN does make the statement that they have projects funded for the next 20 years, and therefore it is a reasonable place uh, to be retaining the data. Now, um, I feel very comfortable with saying, uh, this is what's needed uh, for that to be successful in the Australian space. Noting that ARDC itself, um, if we look at the Nectar Research Cloud, for example, doesn't run the hardware um, that would actually host uh, the data, but certainly being in a position to partner with others uh, to, assure, to ensure that happens. Um, you know, this is a, it's actually a strategic decision as part of a national research infrastructure roadmap. We absolutely agree with the need We've been having lots of discussions internally about um, how the importance of discipline-based uh, repositories provides the additional uh, skills, understanding, expertise for a particular discipline, but it doesn't fit well with a, a single institution. 
uh, at university. We normally look to universities in this space, uh, a single institution holding all of the space. So the technical shape uh, of the solution, I think, would still require crafting and could be done in a way where we um, consider sensitive data restrictions, jurisdictional data restrictions, but there's a lot there. But I, I think going into this roadmap and saying, you need it. And Michael, I'll raise you. I'll go out from the seven years and say, we need a 20 year horizon uh, to have a robust solution for Australia. I'm comfortable with us doing that. I don't know where it will land. Back to you, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so Alison raised uh, Auslit, which is turning 20. Uh, Richard from uh, Osley has just pointed out that they're turning 26 and agree wholeheartedly that community engagement goes a long way in sustaining research infrastructure. But there are a lot of platforms that were set up around the same time, Paradisic, Ausstage, APO, and um, uh, it's, it is... Uh, a hard slog to keep them going is what I would say. It's a lot of hard work and Osley's got the um, fortunate position of having um, a number of benefactors, I believe, um, whereas, you know, some of the other disciplinary areas such as Ausstage, which is, as you probably all know, close to my heart, is a little bit harder to extract money from your community because they're actually struggling themselves. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's, um, there are problems in sustaining these kinds of research projects for sure. Uh, yes, you are integral to the legal profession, Richard, I agree with you. Okay, uh, now a couple of people had their hand up and that is uh, Claudia. I don't know who came first. So I'll start with Claudia. Thanks, Jenny. Um, no worries. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, I see you too. <laughs> For those that don't know me, I'm Claudia Funder from the Research Service at Art Centre Melbourne with the Australian Performing Arts Collection. So in the GLAM sector and performing arts community there. Um, I just wanted to back up what Alison said in terms of the longer term repositories um, with the GLAM sector. Everything we seem to do just keeps getting cut and is very project based and anything that's sort of more long term or business as usual is getting harder and harder to get the work done and get the money for the work to be done, particularly during COVID times, as I'm sure many of you are in the same situation where um, we're all relying on the government and no other sorts of funding and everything else is looking a bit precarious. So um, yeah, I, the, the glam, uh, the other thing about the glam sector is that everybody has such different collecting areas and collecting policies. There's no one place that would be a repository for this stuff. Um, it would by the nature of those organisations, even if they do work long term, to be quite disparate and broken up a bit. Thanks. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, Steve. Um, yeah, I was going to yeah, sort of follow up. I think Rosie said a lot of actually what I was going <laughs> to kind of touch on there. The, uh, 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 I. I think the, the question I come to, which is kind of the summary, which is if it can't be an, um, an increased capability, what, what can be is, is, you know, it has to be something that is a, you know, a permanent institution of some sort or a, some combination thereof. Uh, and that probably needs the, to be the basis of the discussions that I think that we have going forward. This is another one of those, you know, we touched upon what to do about social media, but this is another one of those discussions that really kind of needs a framing for uh, across the, well, across the Haas community, but as, as Rosie pointed out, it, it's not a Haas problem um, <laughs> on its own either. You know, it, it's, you know, the, we're not the only discipline that are dealing with this problem fundamentally. Um, it can be done. I, I say ADA is 40 years old this year. Um, so, you know, we've done it for a little while. Um, I, I think probably, as I say, the evolution that happened in the social sciences is they started out in the sorts of structures that we're talking about. They progressively moved into 
um, actually partnerships between government and academia on you know, basic service provider models. Um, so there are probably models that we can look at um, to try and pick up uh, what, what works internationally. Um, but I think that's, again, another one of those overarching discussions that we probably want to pick up after this. Um, you know, in the context of both the, the IDN and uh, the, the, the cross-project discussions, you know, which repositories where and, and, and what will each of them do has been part of the, the discussion. We don't have a clear answer uh, for the reasons we've just discussed fundamentally. So um, again, that's another one of those kind of framing discussions that we need. You know, it's not a quick discussion, but needs to be, you know, have a shared position. I think um, that's probably the, the space we want to do, look at going forward. Thanks, Steve. And I think Peter Sefton may have had his hand up too. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to respond to what Rosie said as well. Uh, there is um, there is actually a kind of a backstop uh, last resort for putting data, which is the institutions. My understanding is that um, institutions that have signed up to the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research are actually, at least for research under that, which would be all the funded, main funded research, that they're responsible for providing services for, for researchers to meet their obligations to keep data. And so there is a, there is kind of an architect, there is a, there's a policy framework which says that institutions should be making services available to help people with data man management and storage for the appropriate length of time. Um, I think we know that um, it's patchy and a lot of institutions don't have those services or don't have very mature versions of those services. Uh, there was some discussion in the chat earlier on about the institutional publications repositories that were um, seeded by um, funding Arrow and APSR and Rubric, um, which which got, got those things started in the Australian universities. And I think most of those persist now. Um, so it wasn't ongoing funding. So I, while it's really important that we have places to put things like language data, which might be more centralised, um, we should also probably be focusing, and I've spoken to Rosie about this, um, you know, we could we could also look at a parallel program to make sure that we have that institutional support. So some, when somebody does something that needs to be kept, and it doesn't matter about the disorder, this, this is not a has thing, um, it, there's somewhere for it to go. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, well, we're running right to the end of Michael's session, which got a little bit hijacked by some um, concerns that, that, that go across the board, I think. Um, but Michael, would you like to uh, say anything in summary before we go, head back into those more general discussions? Yeah, um, I mean, I really appreciate the, the general discussion that we've, we've had here, because uh, um, perennity, uh, long-term preservation of language data is, is a really key issue that we're, 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 we're sort of building up workflows and, and trying to upskill people to, to work with that, but we, we can't actually solve the problem ourselves, right? Um, so we're really happy to be talking about that. Um, just uh, circling back to the project plan itself, of course, we really welcome um, any feedback you have on what it is we propose in this plan. Of course, remembering it's an 18 month plan. Um, and so some of the constraints are around, um, you know, it's, it's not like fishing in the ocean. There's not so many skilled people. So we have to design things in a way that are actually doable in 18 months in the sense that we know there's actually people we can hire to do the work. Uh, so there are some kind of practicalities involved here that we have built into our project plan. Um, but like I said, we see this, this is a, a we'll call it a 10 year project for the moment. It's the 50 year project, uh, but let's just launch the 10 year one at the moment. Uh, we see this as a 10 year project. And so we're really, you know, all, all the suggestions that you bring to us, um, you know, maybe we're not able to act upon them right now. Um, it's not because we don't care or we don't think those things are really important. Um, but, you know, it's a way of building it up and, and you know, continuing on, on the plans we have in the longer term. And, you know, what we see LDACA is a really important uh, kind of hub within the humanities end of the humanities and social sciences research data commons. Um, but we know there's a lot of other um, humanities researchers uh, out there who have great expertise and we're kind of looking forward to, you know, 
next stage of, of connecting and with that work as well. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, I noticed that there's a couple of new questions that have gone into the, um, the question register. So we'll make sure that those get answered for you. Um, so check back later on there. Yeah, the short answer on our net is they're funded in the same way. Um, so they're not funded for 20 or 30 years either. So they're, they're similar sort of issues. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you very much to Michael, Marco, who's there somewhere, I, I believe, <laughs> and Peter Sefton for filling us in on the Language Data Commons of Australia today. And now we're just going to head into a further general discussion around everything that we've seen today. So thanks to all of the project leads for coming along today and sharing with us. And thank you to everybody who's participated in the discussion as well. I think it's been a really useful day. And once again, I encourage you please to take the time to provide your written feedback to the project leads. Um, and the, as I said, the advisory panel, the project leads and I will be working through that feedback to make sure that we incorporate as much of it as we reasonably can in those plans. And we'll be uh, generating a capability gap register so that we know what we might not need to be doing um, as we look to the future. So um, does anybody have any points that we haven't covered yet today? Ah, can you talk about what you intend integration to be? Okay, um, we can talk about that. Um, I would say that the one of the first cabs off the rank in relation to the integration is uh, the exploration of a tool called CI Logon, which will uh, enable an extension to the existing AAF capability um, and I might ask Peter Sefton if he would be willing to talk us through that work, if he's still with us. Yeah, I just came, I just turned my video back on. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so the, the one of the really um, key things, and again, this is not just for Hass or um, it's for anything, anybody who's dealing with non-open data, um, we, there, we lack infrastructure in, the, in our sector to actually um, provide authorization services for who gets to see what. Now, there's a spectrum of uses for this. So there's some very, um, very highly sensitive data which needs to be kept, um, you know, away from networks. And, you know, um, you may not be able to take your phone in if you're going to go and look at it and those sorts of things. But there is another tier of data which can be put on a network you can have on your laptop, but you have to agree to licenses and you have to, you know, you have to maybe be vetted before you can look at it. So for that, for that tranche of data, um, that covers a lot of what we'll be doing with the language, the language data and a lot of other stuff in the Hass sphere. Um, we're looking at on the LDECA project and, um, and the text analytics platform at ways that we can provide protocols for making sure that the right people get to see data. So that could be under care principles and fair principles, who is meant to be looking at, you know, who, who's allowed to download something, um, and and to be able to separate the concerns so that you have a, a collect, an institution might be responsible for looking after the data and hold a repository, but may not be able to um, authorise somebody to look at something. And that would certainly be the case if you wanted to deposit things at the NLA. They wouldn't be able to work out whether someone's part of a particular cultural group. Um, so it's one, one simple way we're gonna test in the LDACA um, um, project is being able to make sure that everything is stored with a license. Um, so every piece of data has a license. The license will say who's allowed to, um, who's allowed to use that data and download it. Um, and then we can have a separate service, which is where CI logon comes, com, comes in where the people who the custodians of that data can maintain their own cohorts of people, their own groupings. So starting with um, a, a, a linguistics project, we can make sure that the chief investigator of that project um, can name the researchers on the project, put them into a group, 
and we can store the data and then when somebody wants to uh, access it, we can check whether the, the person trying to access it is part of that group. Uh, that's it's distributing the storage in one place, and the storage and management in one place, and the, and the sort of authorization in another place. Uh, so we want that service, which the AAF, um, the Australian Access Federation, can offer to see how that works with, um, with research projects. But it may also work the same model may also work for uh, giving people from various cultural groups or uh, other outside things. Um, so, you know, you could have a collection where, where it's available only for a paid subscription and you would want to check whether someone was in that group of paid subscribers or just check that someone had agreed to a licence. Um, so that it's an important thing for us to, to, for the sort of middle, not the long, not necessarily the whole long tail, but kind of middle bit of the tail of people who need to have uh, appropriate access controls on data. Thanks, Peter. So I should clarify that the integration stream or the shared work packages stream um, is there to uh, benefit all four of the activities. So these are activities that um, will benefit each of the streams um, and work towards it becoming a coherent research data commons. So CI logons, uh, as I said, the first cab off the rank, um, we'll also be working on the Indigenous data governance uh, and rolling that out across the four activities, which becomes another of our integration activities. And uh, we are looking to the future to decide on some other activities as the, as the activities uh, reach a little more maturity in, in their plans and actually get underway. So uh, watch this space, Nick. Are there any other questions? Or points for discussion? Nope. Everyone's just probably just exhausted by now, really. <laughs> We've been here for hours. If, if I can ask, um, um, what does success look like? I know these are pilot projects, but there's often been an emphasis on cutting edge research. So I was wondering what the, what the blend between being cutting edge and being pilot is in the sense that there's a long tail for Haas researchers, I suppose. What does success look like? Um, success for us looks like achieving what we've laid out in those plans for a start uh, and also being able to demonstrate that the Haas community can collaborate clearly and um, so that we open ourselves up for future investment through the through Encris, I think yeah, that looks like success to me. Yeah. So in, in Hass, are we trying to tell the federal government that we're capable of this, and then please give us more money in the future, for example? Yes. This is a capability test in a way, I suppose. Um, Jenny. Yes. Right. Shall I jump in? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question, Paul. I think it's one of the most important uh, things we have to keep in mind. Um, we've heard about some really ambitious projects today. And I think if there's the, the, what troubles me most um, is trying to boil the ocean in 18 months. How, how do we make sure that this particular phase uh, is successful and that comes back to having a really shared vision of what success is. So if I may, I'm going to go back to 2016. And in 2016, I had the privilege of being a member of the expert working group for the roadmap, um, which was, was absolutely amazing. Um, and at that time, and at Actually, at that time, I worked in nanotechnology and nanofabrication, so a lot changes in five years. Um, but at that time, what was really clear 
is that for national research infrastructure, and I'm being really specific here, we couldn't, as an expert working group, identify the national capability gap that required investment through NCRIS. Didn't mean there weren't gaps, didn't mean there weren't needs. It was the expert working group at the time could not say, this is where we need to uh, go forward. What the expert working group could say is there is a need within HASS. Uh, work needs to be done to identify those projects. And of course, over the last few years, that's where several pieces of work have been undertaken, um, including uh, a piece of work by ARDC and by, by academies as well. Um, and as a result of that work, we have this incredible opportunity um, through this activity and the, the funding associated with it to demonstrate, yes, as a community, uh, these four projects uh, demonstrate that we have shared needs that cannot be met by a single institution or a small group of institutions. They are genuinely national needs. Okay. And so within these four streams, we have heard today of some really exciting work, but we've also heard about some shared challenges, the repositories question, uh, the social media question. Peter has just spoken about the um, authentication and authorization questions the indigenous governance questions. For us to come together as a group, identify these issues and say, well, across these four projects, it's allowing us to explore some of this space. That's the sense that it's a pilot for me more than anything else. Okay. And success for me would be, and I'm being really specific as the CEO of the ARDC, success is that this community's needs get recognised okay. in the upcoming roadmap. Okay. And whether it's the establishment of a new increase capability in 2023, whether it remains with the ARDC for a little bit longer, you know, there are different pathways, but it's it's recognizing that. So that was a really long answer, Paul, but it's something I think that's worth sharing um, with the entire group. Really important question. I oh, know, but on that point, uh, again, are we trying to foster cutting edge research or in a sense, bring together our community? Just because there's a tension there, I think sometimes as, as an academic, I want to you know get published rather than spend three months on I don't know, meeting the parliament or doing a communications plan or, or you know, this type of thing. It's kind of what I'm, that tension right there, you know. Okay, that, that's a really good question. And this is also not uh, confined to the, the current community. Um, there is a real hit associated with building and developing research infrastructures yeah. to an academic's career. Yes. And it ultimately comes back to a personal decision, you know, which path do you want to follow? Uh, and this, this is something I'm quite certain will come up in the roadmap. The career pathways and professional recognition for staff that uh, support research infrastructures throughout their career is a, a really difficult, unrecognized field. Um, and having the appropriate professional development, recognition, reward um, associated with a career pathway in research infrastructure is, is something that we've been talking about. I mean, I'm approaching two decades in NCRIS. It's been talked about for a very long time. Um, is this roadmap going to be the one where something really happens okay. uh, for that, that terribly important cohort of staff, um, which by the way, of course, includes all of the ARDC team. So that's just a big thank you from me to all of them today. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and thanks, Rosie. Um, Ingrid um, has directed a question at Kylie Brass, who 
I don't know if Kylie's still with us. I am still here. So it's a question about um, the work that Rosie just mentioned, um, a, a kind of preparatory work that we did that essentially became the scoping piece um, and um, the ARDC were obviously commissioned as well to do a piece of work um, that fed into the, the research, the shape of the research data commons. It wasn't, you know, the only game in town in a sense. And we did a piece of work, the Academy of the Humanities, on mapping international research infrastructures. I have spoken to Bernadette Kelly at the department again this morning, and she has undertaken to get that up on the website. She doesn't see there being an issue making ours available. Um, so that's what I've been told at the moment. It's not something I, if people get in touch with me directly, I can share the report, um, she said to me, but I can't make it publicly available and the department will. So they're not, um, it's one of the things that's been in the backlog of, of um, to get up on the website. So that was encouraging. Um, it, there were three studies done. So Kylie, do you know if they're only going to make your study available? I said, I said um, there were three studies done. There was one done by Dandelo, there was ours, and there was yours, the ARDC one. Um, I've apparently the Dandelo piece is not, you know, it was more of an internal piece that was feeding into some thinking that the um, department was doing. That's my understanding. Um, and I, I, I know nothing further sort of in that sort of space. So it's ours was a sort of um, quite comprehensive sort of research piece, as I understand yours was, um, and there was a lot of consultation around yours. I think that, um, you know, yours and ours are in the same boat in terms of making them available. Ours has no costings associated with it. Yours probably does, in which case there'd be some things that they would need to, to take out. Um, but I, I would say um, that, that it would make sense for both of those reports to be made available. I impressed on her, you know, that otherwise it just looks like we're sitting on stuff when we're not. And there's nothing, I mean, to my eyes, in our report that, um, that can't be made public, you know, from the point of view of how it would be useful, I guess, into some of the, the discussions around um, the National Research Infrastructure Roadmap and, you know, some of the international models. So it's a, yeah, um, I think the ARDC project and ours falls into that category. Yeah, I agree. And I think for the purposes of transparency, it would be really helpful to have both of those yeah. reports yeah. Um, made public. And as you say, if they need to redact the financial information that's in the ARDC one, yeah. I don't think that's very hard to do. Um, uh, Rosie, I may leave that conversation with you to have with. And it's fine. I'll just confirm with Bernadette that she's viewing them as a pair. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. And I think then everyone can read them and um, that gives you some more context to the program as it stands today anyway. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Rosie. I'm muted. Are there any more questions? Uh, just a follow up comment on that, Jenny. My, my recollection is there's some discussion, back to our social media discussion earlier, there is actually some discussion of what might be the some of the social media requirements, at least in a basic stage, in some of those earlier documents as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't mention them earlier because, <laughs> because for, uh, say, because they're not public documents. But yeah. I think, you know, initial thinking, at least on that, has gone into that. It's not advanced, but, you know, it does start the conversation at least. So, yeah. Michael. Yeah, um, just just on the, um, the whole Hess question, um, I, I'll just outline one worry I have about that. And my worry is Hess is really large and diverse and, and no one would ever think of saying, what should we do for science? <laughs> like, like, you, know, you scientists just get together and figure out what you want. I, I don't think that would be quite hard, I suppose, from uh, the bits of science I know at least. Um, so I, 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 I understand that's the place we're in and we want an investment in HASS. Um, but the more we can think, I, I just worry that this could get so large 
Um, already the number of relationships we have to have internally within our DACA, and as we reach out to other partners, it's really, it really gets quite large. And so I do think eventually we're going to have to find ways to, of course, connect capabilities, but perhaps having one huge mega capability may be a little unwieldy. Um, I don't know who's going to be CEO of that capability, but oof, that would be one heck of a job, right? Um, so I know that's, in a sense, probably not what we're shooting for, and, and it's kind of a, a pathway and so on, but it's probably worth thinking about how we deal with the just the scale, actually, of what we're talking about here. Mm, that's a very good point. Um, Rosie, do you have any comments on that? Completely agree, Michael. Uh, it makes about as much sense as let's have one increased capability for all of science. Um, I'm going to not say anything. <laughs> I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see what um, the 2021 expert working group come back with in their exposure draft, and it would be um, unhelpful for me to comment prior to that. Yeah. Thank you. I don't manage that very often, Jenny. <laughs> No, that's true. <laughs> I, I, May I just come in? Um, sure, there was someone. It was there. Howard, but let you get him first. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, I think um, Hass is a construct. It's a convenience. You know, it's not um, helpful at times and it's helpful in other ways. It's barged us in. We've wedged the door open a little bit. So in a sense, it's ours to manage what that might mean, I guess. How that is translated into the roadmap, I don't know yet. Um, so in the past, there have been has capabilities scoped in. There's been, there was another form of words that was used at another point in time. I think one of the things that has, um, two things I think that haven't been successful for us, we've run a deficit argument a bit, we haven't got we are missing out, you haven't funded us, rather than leading with what we actually have been able to do very innovatively across um, the system big time. And, um, and I think that's being recognised now. And I think that there's a lot for the infrastructure that we have built to actually feed into the roadmap and for the roadmap to understand what, you know, has collectively can offer wider increase and that you know modern research is about a whole lot of multidisciplinarity i also think that what you're doing and what this program's doing is grounding has in its domain where there's overlap obviously as well and so in the doing you know um and on the ground these things will start to sort out i yeah um i mean there might be points at which you need to centralize things and points where that doesn't need to happen so, yeah, I mean, I think at the moment I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a sort of mixed attitude to using the term has, you know, but I guess a means to an end. Indeed. Um, yeah. Hello? Yeah, Howard and then Alison, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm struck by um, sort of two issues and what they might, uh, how they might relate to each other. And one of those issues is the issue, issue of the sustainability of uh, products such as paradisic and so on in the long term that have been developed. The other is the nature of career structures uh, that enable uh, people with expertise and their professional, uh, if you like, uh, life is associated with the maintenance of those particular uh, products rather than uh, as an aspect of their life as a researcher or uh, user and so on and so forth. And in a sense, there's a major kind of gap that exists, which is um, the distribution uh, and uh, uh, storage of um, uh, digital uh, information. So 
in a sense, if you had a national distributed data repository and digital information distribution service that was linked into local kind of regions, then that would be the area in which those uh, already, if you like, developed resources could be located. Uh, and um, if you do an analogy with something like radio, which is an old fashioned medium in some ways, it is obviously now digital, but you actually have something called Yolngu Radio, which operates right the way across Northeast Arnhem Land because it's understood uh, that radio is an important medium of communication and so on and so forth. So resources will go into that. But if at the moment you are looking at ways in which you could uh, uh, distribute and house digital information uh, that may be uh, the uh, songs and uh, that kind of data that's being recorded, but it could also be uh, the existing population data that is uh, um, uh, you know, used by different communities and so on and so forth, that you could actually have uh, a, a system like that. Um, when governments think of, well, let's create something like that, they always tie it onto something else. So they say, oh, well, let's have the Northern Territory Libraries Service uh, operating such and such. But of course, those institutions have other core businesses and suddenly you find, gosh, no, it doesn't do that anymore and so on and so forth. And also it's not dedicated for that particular kind of thing. So it does seem that at the level of institutions that can actually solve and support some of these particular problems, you do need something different. Now, I say that sort of, uh, uh, you know, coming from the left field, because obviously it's not the primary objective or anything that we're doing, but I, it may be uh, for some of these things, the solution that has got to happen. Anyway, that's what I think. Thank you. And Alison. I have two comments on the HASS issue that might be pertinent or not. The first, and obviously I agree, I think it's far too broad on all of the practices. The first thing is that one of the things that actually HASS and social sciences work differently to science and where this is an advantage is that the data sources are much more common across the whole. So the sorts of data that you're talking about aggregating potentially into a capability actually are used by researchers in quite different disciplines. And that's not, un, it's not obviously never happens in sciences, but it's much less common. So the astronomers manage their own data because that's a discipline that has specific data that it needs. But there is some logic here to having some data that is managed across, um, particularly for the social sciences who are often using government data, which is privacy protected and held in government agencies, not the business of the library. So that's just one thing that I think can be leveraged in working together and that it is worth acknowledging is that the security and the safety of that data. The corollary of that, of course, is that a lot of the data that's needed by both humanities and the social sciences is not created by those researchers, which is also a little bit different to a lot of science disciplines and therefore mediates itself towards having an external form of management or control. But the other thing, which is, I'm going to speak briefly just as a public servant because I do spend most of my life in the public service and some of the decisions here are being made by public servants. I actually do think that these projects should have some outcome that does contribute to cutting edge research or research done in a different way to the way that it has been before. And I think that that should be connected to public, to a measure, I'll go back to measurable, public servants love things that are measurable, to measurable impact. Because I think one of the things that we're also, I think there's a lot of things that are being struggled with around the humanities here. And some of it is about the humanities relationship to infrastructure full stop and certainly the humanities relationship to the digital. But the other thing that it's worth acknowledging is that I also think there's a lack of understanding of the way the humanities itself actually produces research and what it does. And I'm talking more about the humanities and the social sciences here, which I think have a more solid grounding. So I think if, it, it's not, I think, the main point, but I think part of it to fire the imaginations of the public servants who are involved in doing this, it is the to produce something out of this that can be pointed to and said, we got an answer to that research question. And that meant that this community can do something different would be very powerful in, an, in building more understanding of who we are and what we do. So I don't think it's the main purpose. I do agree about that piece, but I wouldn't underestimate the importance of being able to connect this to a research output and that output in turn to something that is um, 
you know, that actually has changed something about the way that this country works. And on that note, I'll leave it. Thanks, Alison. Uh, Robert Ackland has got his hand raised as well. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a response to um, Rosie Hicks's comment earlier on. <clears throat> Rosie, you suggested that there's kind of a pathway that, that a, um, an academic has to take. Either you go down the pathway of becoming a, a sort of a, a provider of um, an e-research professional, shall we say, or you stay on a sort of a research pathway because of the costs associated with um, the research impact that's going to be associated with providing tools and data uh, to a wider group of people. And I, I take the point you made, but I also think that there's a third way, um, a third pathway. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that this ARDC approach is catering to this third type of researcher. And that is the researcher who is both an active researcher, but also someone who makes their tools and data available to a, a wider, you know, publicly available. And this is done typically through open source software, through, through GitHub uh, or through CRAN, developing packages for, for, for R that get hosted on CRAN. And this is a way that leads to measurable impact because people don't download and use your software unless they find it useful. And the same with data sets. And I think that this is kind of where computational social science, researchers in, in computational social sciences can, <clears throat> excuse me, can um, gain impact is by sharing their data and code through, through these, these repositories. And so I just feel that the ARDC approach tends to focus on archives and repositories and big infrastructure. And I can understand why because there's a lot of it works for a lot of data and a lot of research communities but i don't think it covers all the bases and I, there, there are other people who are falling through the cracks i think um and it's in some ways it's forcing researchers to become consumers while i think the technologies of today and this is kind of the promise of e-research right back from the, two, the mid 2000s is it's it's meant to allow people to become both consumers and producers of research tools and data. And the technology is there. And I just think that in some ways, this is not being um, really, it's, it's, not, it's not reflected in the ARDC strategy uh, or approach to funding infrastructure. Um, and uh, also I just feel that it, it makes it difficult for those of us who are active researchers to keep across everything because, um, because of this, perhaps it's viewed that there is this pathway that you need to take. If you want to become involved in infrastructure, you need to become an e-research professional. And therefore you need to be spending all your time participating in roadmaps and uh, making sure you're part of the right conversations. And um, I guess it just concerns me that that might, yeah, as I said, some people might be falling through the cracks um, perhaps I'm talking about myself here, but yeah. So, Thank you. Robert, no, Jenny, I'm going to to um, have the the reply to this one, if I may. Of course, uh, you Robert, may. Uh, it's really important that I communicate to this group that the ARDC is not a funder. You know, historically, ANS, Nectar, and RDS, the the um, previous organisations, uh, offered a lot of seed funding for activities. Um, the ARDC is not a funder, it's a collaborator as a national research infrastructure. And it's, it's absolutely vital um, that we share this understanding because it's a, why would you do it through another organization? Why wouldn't you just do it through the ARC or the NHMRC, for example? Um, so it's really important that that is, is the, the starting point. But notwithstanding that, Coming back to the point that you've raised, Robert, that there are two aspects. Um, I absolutely agree that the ARDC and indeed the NCRIS model um, doesn't currently address the activities that you're describing um, in the way that a researcher um, could be creating um, software or code and, and making it open stack, uh, uh, sorry, open source. 
open stack in the case of the Nectar Research Cloud, uh, but open source. Um, the ARDC is not a funder and doesn't support that particular type of activity right now. Um, as a research infrastructure, we do employ staff uh, and our staff um, headcount is approaching 80 people at the moment, but we employ them uh, to collaborate on activities for their expertise. And, and note that for our staff, uh, the KPIs that they have would not give them a successful academic pathway. And I think that doesn't recognize the enormous uh, expertise and the enormous contribution that they make to the research infrastructure uh, landscape. And it's really important that this third stream um, is broadly acknowledged across our sector. And I say that because there's a couple of institutions, a couple of universities that are really making some good strides uh, forward to recognizing this particular blend of uh, skills and expertise and I absolutely welcome it. And that, that's what I'm looking for more in the future. So, um, you know, the national research infrastructure is not designed to support um, the career pathways of individual academics. Rather, it's, it, and I come back to this again, it, it's uh, supporting things that couldn't be undertaken by a single institution or small group of institutions. So that's where we're looking at the, the national. But the bit I will pick up on, uh, Robert, that you raise, that's, that's the situation as it is at the moment. And I think that where we are in code and research software, you know, it could be a decade behind where we are in the recognition of the value of data. And I think we, we have recent, and Reese is um, just putting these links here in the chat for us. I, I think that the recognition of research software as a first class research output and the national agenda for research software is an activity that we're really focusing on right now. And that the future um, shape and contributions of the research software engineers uh, are still, still a glint in the eye. And I think things will change um, as we go forward on that pathway. So there are 10, in, in summary, and I don't give short answers, you might tweak that. In summary, um, I think there is a change we need in the future, but I also come back to what's the role of a national research infrastructure there. And, and I would encourage everyone um, that's on the Zoom this afternoon, take a look at that research software um, agenda for Australia. It's another part of the ARDC's work um, for the, the current six months and of course going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Rosie. So we've got only a few minutes left of our session. So once again, I'd really like to thank everybody for participating, in particular our project leads and um, the others involved in those four activities. Um, please remember that the question registers will remain open. So if you think of anything that you would like answered, please pop it in there and we'll make sure that it gets answered for you. And uh, don't forget to submit your feedback. So feedback again closes on the 27th of September and we really want to have as many voices heard. Uh, so please do take the time to submit that feedback for us. Um, moving forwards, um, obviously the plans will go to the uh, board or those that are ready will go to the board in October. And, and we will keep you informed of the progress along the way anyway. And as you've registered for today, we will be sending you the link to the recording for today. So you'll be able to have a look back if you need to over everything that we've discussed. Um, I might leave final words with Rosie Hicks. Perhaps Rosie would like to sign us out for today. 
Thanks, Jenny. Um, I will just make one uh, logistical comment. Um, so we, we, I think today have the feeling that three of the four plans will go to the ARDC board in October. Of course, we wait for advice from our um, advisory committee before committing to that. Mm. So you know that we, we have set out a very clear process um, and I wouldn't want to, to short circuit that at all. What I think it's really important uh, to say to the group today, though, we've structured this really carefully. We've put a lot of thought into being able to move the four streams at different speeds. Um, we're having some excellent conversations with Alison and her team uh, about how we move that stream forward. And I think what we'll be doing after today's meeting um, is confirming a target timeline um, you know, I'm not sure how, uh, I'm not sure what the error bars are um, on that at the moment, but we'll certainly look at that. We'll look at the timing of future board meetings and communicate to this group pretty quickly um, what the timeline is uh, for that um, trove stream. And I, I just want to come back to a comment that was made earlier today um, with regard to responding to questions on all those projects. Uh, please don't miss this opportunity right now. We might have revisions and iterations, um, but don't wait uh, before letting us know uh, your thoughts on the current status of the plans because they are essential in helping guide us um, along that pathway. So that, that was a little bit of detail there. Uh, and I will conclude then by thanking everyone for their contributions. Uh, not just today, but along the pathway for everyone that participated in the workshops, preparing the draft plans to the advisory committee, um, to all of you that are in these conversations. Um, we're only just at the beginning of a really important journey. Um, and I would give also my thanks uh, to all the ARDC um, team that are working on this and, and particularly Jenny, of course. Um, you are our most important asset. And uh, so many, many thanks and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.